Good morning, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. I'm Jeannie Allen, the founder and CEO of the Center for Education Reform, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this virtual mini fest, um, countering COVID, um, what we have to do to make sure that education doesn't fall into the curve. Let me first start by saying that I am so grateful to all of you, not only for joining us today, wherever you are, uh, the CER team is spread out through the DMV area today, as well as in places like Kentucky and North Carolina and elsewhere. And while we are veterans to remote um, working, it's still very, very hard uh, given the circumstances. So our hearts um, go out to all of you. Um, you are in our thoughts and um, more importantly, uh, your dedication and commitment to joining us and to helping us um, cut the curve for uh, not just COVID, but for education during this uh, day and age is absolutely critical. Um, let me go in and bring in my co-host for the event, Michael Musanti, who's been a partner in crime at CER, and we will get this party started. So can somebody let um, Michael go live? Otherwise, I will keep dancing. All right, there you are. Michael Musanti, how are you? Good. How are you, Jeannie? Fine, thank you. So Michael, let's talk about this event really quickly and give folks an overview of, um, of where we are um, and uh, maybe do, do a little housekeeping. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am Michael Masante, Executive Vice President for the Center for Education Reform. Uh, and uh, as she said, uh, Jeannie Allen said, partner in crime. Um, Jeannie, I just gotta, I gotta throw out though very quickly, we have uh, I'm looking at the participant number going up, and uh, I know that all of them uh, are not on video, and it reminds me of the old joke about how everyone used to say Walter Cronkite never wore pants in his uh, broadcast, because you could only see him from the uh, chest down. So, uh, but so, so I, hope that, say, I hope you're not saying anything about what we, that's a bad visual, Michael. <laughs> no, suffice to say, we're all dressed uh, fully, and I just wanted to start off on a little lighter note, but... Thank you so much to all of you school leaders, teachers, parents out there on the front lines. I've been getting lots and lots of texts from charter leaders across the country and those, especially in Washington, DC, who are very close friends of mine and they are doing the best they can. And so what we hope this will do is offer very straightforward, practical solutions for you. Whether you're a, cheer, a charter leader, a district school leader, a parent, a teacher, we will want to just put tools into your hands or put really solid information in your hands on a practical level that you can use. So Jeannie? And, and you know, it's so important because, um, of course it's so important, right? That's a no brainer. But we are hearing from so many of you on a regular basis. We just want to do our part to um, connect you directly with the technologists and the people out there who are getting this work done for you. This is a very small, group of the thousands out there. And we're hoping just by giving you this little um, connection today, this small micro mini uh, fest, um, it'll spark more interest, more questions, maybe more solutions. And um, if interested, um, we will keep plugging along. So let me go ahead and um, help uh, us kick this off with our first opening um, leader and speaker, our dear friend, the chairman of the Center for Education Reform, the founder of GSV and co-founder of the ASU GSV Summit, Michael Mo. Hi, Jeannie. Oh, Hi, Michael. Oh. Hi, everybody. You're not on video yet. I guess hey, we're, Michael. I guess we're waiting <laughs> for the video. There, there he is. Look at that. I love that green screen, Michael. You are awesome. Listen, Michael, you've got a lot to share with us. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to um, attend one of the first in a weekly summit series that you guys are doing. And I just love your framing of where we need to be. And I just thought you could help kind of inspire us all. So I will turn over the, um, the screen to you to, uh, to go. Thank you so much. And again, uh, appreciate you uh, organizing this, putting this together. It is so important, um, not only because of the crisis that we are facing, but really just this ongoing crisis that um, has been happening in, in our schools for uh, many years. And I think the fact of the matter is, here everybody realizes people are dying, but the fact is we put kids in schools, 
that don't give them the skills and knowledge and education they need to be successful in life. And they basically um, are, are dying in a different way. And I think that's, I'm not, I'm not trying to be too dramatic. I think that's just the way it is. Um, clearly, um, you know, we've gone through uh, a shock to the system here over the past couple of months. Um, you know, we have a, a million people around the world that have been diagnosed with uh, coronavirus. Uh, and that 20% or more than 20% of that's the United States. You know, 50,000 people have died economically. You just saw the data yesterday, another 6.6 .6 million people put on employment. And it's the, the devastation here is substantial and it's and, and people's lives are <clears throat> being impacted and that's um, you know our, our hearts uh, go out to all the people directly affected and also just the, the the deep level of gratitude that we have for the first responders and the healthcare uh, uh, professionals that are putting their life in harm's way to fight this invisible insidious um, Oh, and, and, and we are going to defeat it, uh, but it's, it's definitely been a gigantic challenge. Something that's happened with this whole um, crisis is the fact that you now have 1.4 billion students, K-12 and, and college, that have been put online overnight. That includes, and that doesn't include the over 100 million teachers and professors that have had the same consequence. And when you look at what's happened in the uh, digital learning space, what we're calling this the dawn of the age of digital learning because what's happened effectively is you've had a shift for the past 25 years of more and more instruction and uh, courses and so forth being delivered online. But this has basically accelerated everything into the future. Effectively, you know, you've had, you know, over a billion people that have gotten thrown in the deep end of the online learning pool. And what we think is going to happen, you're, you know, you're told basically to sink or swim. And what's going to happen with that is, you know, some people well, are going to sink. Some people are going to basically crawl to the edge of the pool and get out and say, gosh, I'm never going to go back in there again. It was, it was, it was too terrible experience. What we're going to have is a lot of people, a lot of students, a lot of teachers, a lot of professors that say, you know, they, they got comfortable with it after initially being frightened. And they said, you know what, this is pretty good. And they're going to never, you know, they're going to continue to enjoy it and utilize it more and more and more. And I really believe that's what we're seeing take place here. I think it's, it's really become, you know, not only the dawn of, of digital learning, but I think you're seeing this uh, really kind of acceleration into the future which is exciting for the overall mission that we have, which is giving everybody an equal opportunity to participate in the future. Talent, we believe, is equally distributed, opportunities not. And what technology and digital learning has the opportunity to do is to dramatically um, uh, equal the, the playing field, democratizing learning, increasing access, lowering the cost. And we think with the technologies we're seeing, improve the quality, and, and we think that's happening uh, not way into the future. We think that's actually happening today. So what I like to say is we've got, you know, we had bef before Corona, um, we had, and that's uh, BC, and we have after, after the disease, which we call AD. And we've entered this, we're entering this AD period where the transformation that's taking place um, in the digital learning space has happened before our eyes. We, we have companies that were, publicly, it's been shown, you know, companies like Coursera have had a four to five times increase in the number of students that have registered with them over the last couple of weeks. Four, and they already had 50 million students on their platform. I mean, explosion. Class Dojo is another company where there's public, you know, on articles data, you know, said five to eight times increase in the number of students, parents, and, and, and teachers that have signed up on their platform recently. And that's, it's, 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 it's truly you know, remarkable in terms of the, the growth. And I think the key part is that you see success and you see um, results that, that are derived from this increased activity and people getting increasingly comfortable with this. 
one last comment I have, you know, as we talk about the AV world that you know we're we're entering today, is when you see truly transformative change in any industry, it's where you're seeing converging technologies, disruptive technologies coming together with uh, to create unique, powerful solutions. And so, you know, today when you look at the digital learning space. You know, online learning has, has um, you know, really come into its own. It's a $160 billion industry last year, growing to $330 billion uh, in the next five years. But you're seeing these converging disruptive technologies of 5G, which is 20 times faster than 4G. You have blockchain, which is going to create not only a distributed ledger, but really be able to create knowledge as a currency. So it's not just your degree or other formal academic credentials that give you opportunity in the future. AI with personalized learning and, and RoboEd and video and, uh, and augmented reality and, and, uh, uh, and virtual reality. All these coming together to create unique solutions. So whether you're having a virtual lab, take an exa exa uh, advantage of, of 5G and augmented reality, or whether you're doing uh, personalized learning through robotics and artificial intelligence. All this is not some space age fantasy. It's all happening today, and it's gonna make a radically different uh, outcome, we think, for children's lives and their opportunity for the future. So I'm very excited, Jeannie and, and Michael, for the Center for, Center for Education Reform being in the front of this, hosting this uh, webinar today. I'm looking forward to the conversation and I'll be back uh, kind of giving a summary with, with others um, after uh, we've been able to go through the program. So thank you. Michael, that. thank you. Let me just ask you one quick question before you, um, you leave us. There was a question from Michael Flood. How do we unlock the educational opportunities for millions of families? The broadband issue, obviously, people to choose online virtual right now. What do, what do you see as the most and um, important and immediate thing we can all be doing? Yeah, well, I mean, again, I think access is, is important and I think it's, you can't just say, well, everybody uh, has access to, to broadband, everybody has access to a device because they don't, but that's a relatively small problem. That's, a, that's it's quantifiable. You look in the context of a world where we just put $2 trillion uh, out there to help small businesses and, and, and try to keep the economy afloat. I mean, the, 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 the technolo technological issues are certainly, you know, yesterday, the device issues, I mean, they get cheap devices. We just got to make sure that everybody has access to it. I think the second issue is, is literally the adoption and then people getting familiar and comfortable because the natural reaction, unless you need to do something is you put it off. You say, you know, what I'm doing is fine. It's, it's uncomfortable for me to learn something different. I think the biggest issues are not that of, you know, can, can you solve this? Can you get poor kids and families that um, are under-resourced? Can you give them that? We can solve that in many different ways. The biggest issue is this kind of acceleration of getting comfortable, familiar. And again, I think part of the, 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 the silver lining in this, in this dark cloud is the fact that people have been forced to get online. People have been forced to use digital technology. And again, it's, I think you've seen that kind of natural, uncomfortable to, hey, this is pretty good and to never going back. And that's, I think, really exciting. Great, I'll let Michael Masanti take it from here. Thank you, Michael Mo. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, we are delighted to welcome our first uh, two guests, our first panel. Um, I am joined or will be joined shortly by Jeff Kwiatkowski, uh, who is a senior vice president for K-12 online learning and uh, also Ann Brown from waterford.org. We're going to go with Jeff uh, first. Jeff, um, I think you're on. Are you not? Or can we get Jeff live? Can you hear me? We can hear you, Jeff. Hopefully okay. we can see you soon as well. Go ahead and uh, cl click on your video if you can. But um, Jeff, let's get started. Uh, we heard Michael just say that so many people have been forced into online learning at this point. And what I think is, is quite interesting is online courses, online instruction. A, a lot of people think it's completely new, but it's, it's really not, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's true. Just a little quick technical thing. Uh, there we go. Start the video. There it comes. All right. Hopefully it's popping on. We'll, we'll get that well, uh, we'll get that fixed. Um, okay, I'll just uh, I'll get going here. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. And you're right, Michael, it's, uh, um, you know, a lot of questions about right now is everybody's diving into the deep end of online learning, remote learning, as 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 Michael said uh, earlier. Uh, but it's really not that new. For a lot of folks, it feels new, but it's not as new as some some may think. Online learning has been happening now for 20 years. Uh, we know that in uh, full-time online schools, there's over 400, nearly 400,000 students that are learning in full-time online schools today. There's thousands of teachers that have been a part of what online learning has been happening now for several, several years. We have schools in over 30 states. So I guess my message really, and our message over the last couple of weeks is not only does it have to be done because of the crisis that we're in, but it can be done. And I think that should give hope to families and teachers and schools that may be struggling and trying to figure out how, to, how can we do this. They can look to certain models that, you know what, this has been done and uh, it's been done well. Um, but it is a difficult transition. There's no question about it. We know in these online schools, most of them are there. Uh, the students are there by choice. Uh, in this case, families are not choosing this. This has been sort of thrown onto them. But, um, but again, if there was ever a time to promote innovation, to promote uh, partnerships with public education and new models of learning, today is the day. And, and you know, Jeff, that's, and that's what we wanna do today. We wanna point folks in the, uh, in the direction of where these things are. And I know, you know they could go to the K-12 website right now and they could look at solutions that you guys offer and have delivered to a number of school districts over the years. Now, and, and, I, and, and we want to do that today, but you know, just there are some policy issues that have come up. What about the equity issue? You know, we, is it impossible for some students in low income areas? And I know, you know the chancellor of DC uh, traditional public school system has talked about how 30% of the city of Washington DC isn't covered. And, and it's just shocking to me uh, that I live in a city where it just already isn't completely covered by free Wi-Fi, right? Um, and then there's a lot of issues, and Jeff, I know, and, and, if, and if you can go deeper into this about how do students with disabilities learn yeah. online. And, and I just think it's shocking to me that there's a lot of people who are naysayers saying, this can't happen, this can't happen, this can't happen. And to Michael's point, They've always been this way about technology, right? Well, I think that's right. You know, I think what we saw in those first couple of weeks was you know, paralysis of, you know, how do we do this? And then questions around equity came up. And these are, these are very real questions. How do we serve students who are in rural communities? How do we serve students with disabilities? Um, how is it possible to be able to, um, you know, bridge this digital divide that takes place? Um, I guess, uh, again, the, the issues, and, and I was really glad to see that there were a, a lot of momentum. There was a lot of momentum towards saying, these are challenges, but we're going to try to overcome them. And I think the, the, the um, U.S. Department of Education did an excellent job when it said that there should be nothing in federal law that should prohibit the shift to distance learning right now um, and to allow for districts to be innovative and creative and learn and help kids learn. Continuity of learning matters so much. But in the field of online learning, we've addressed these issues for, for, for over 20 years now. We've addressed them uh, with respect to low-income students, with rural communities, special needs uh, communities as well too. Um, you know, right now with K-12, there's over 15,000 students with disabilities that we're serving. From mild to moderate to severe disabilities, we're serving them. And interesting you know, about 85% of all those related services are delivered online. So I think there was a lot of questions people had is how can we possibly deliver special education outside of the classroom? Well, it is being done and it's being done effectively. In fact, it's one of the, one of the reasons why a lot of special education families choose online schools is because of the types of services, the way in which it's delivered um, is actually better uh, in their view. So right now our teams are working 
uh, to adjust those IEPs where there were face-to-face -face, um, services being provided to move them as, as quickly as we can onto the, uh, into the uh, virtual space. Uh, and if not, provide those compensatory services. But we're very optimistic, our team is, uh, that, it, that it can be done and it is being done. Um, and you know, the other thing, online schools are providing technology and uh, internet access to students in, in rural communities. We're providing um, technology, computers, to families who uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch. So uh, again, there are huge challenges, no question. I don't wanna suggest that it's not. But you know, looking to various models and how it's been done uh, should give hope to schools, to families, to educators that indeed it can be done. And that's exactly what we're trying to do, step into that gap and say, look, we know there's huge challenges, but we want to be a resource. We want to be a help because we have thousands of educators. We work with 6,000 teachers and there's tens of thousands of more online school teachers with expertise uh, to be able to do this. And, and I'll say this too, the families that we serve, the teachers that we serve, almost to everyone were, were in a traditional school prior to enrolling into the online school. They've made that transition. They have knowledge to share. And, uh, you know, so this is really a time, I think, for uh, ed tech providers, for online learning providers, for the educators that have been in this field for several, several years to really step up and serve and help their, their peers in the traditional system. And, and so, and let me ask a question because we're getting a lot of questions that are popping up and we'll get to those. Um, but I wanted to quickly ask, so have you been, have you, has the Department of Education reached out to you? Have local districts reached out mm -hmm. to you? Because you are saying that you're getting this done and, and we've got some questions from some rural areas. We have some questions of, okay, hey, look, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've got some sped, we've got some sped students. How do we deliver it? How do we right. actually- well, and Michael, let me just jump in here too. More, yeah. more also to the point, let's get really granular. And I know we should bring Ann in because part of the reason to have this panel is so we can also, she's doing early childhood at home and in rural. But I want Ann, you to jump in also for the rest of the conversation and for Jeff to address some of these questions we're getting. How precisely are you servicing the special needs kids? Teachers are struggling with that mm -hmm. is one question. You know, what are the tools? People are looking for tools. The difference between what we're doing today and you guys have to help us and we'll make, we'll, we'll work on right. it and we'll get all improved, but is to not be high level to say, here's what you can use now. It's not just you have to hire me for this product, but these are the actual things we're doing. We've posted yeah, things, we try to find them, but what are you guys doing to make, to make that happen? So let's have Jeff answer that and then and jump in and then keep kind of going through some of those questions too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. And, and you know, I, I don't want to uh, suggest that I'm in any more the, the expert at the field, but that's why I work with a great team of, of educators that do this every single day. And, you know, they, they talk about the tools, the technology tools to provide accessibility to the students, the you know, speech therapy tools that they're using and so forth. We have webinars up on our website, um, and I know that uh, we're working with, is to, to, to Michael's point, uh, with uh, state officials, with district officials, who that's their primary concern right now, and we're trying to provide them help and support along the way. But there are plenty of tools, there are plenty of, of, of methods, of, of, of ways to be able to address this. And I think the creativity that our team has done, and I think that we're trying to lend to, to expertise to others to be able to shift those IEPs into the virtual setting and provide quality services to those students that meet those IEP goals um, is, I think we're going to have a lot of success stories over the next few weeks. Yeah. Hi, Jeannie. Thanks. Um, for us, yes, we have been reached out to by state offices as well as, um, as, well as you know, some districts. But what we did is we sort of took a prioritization level and we said, we have 280,000 users out there. So three, the first 30,000 are our home users and they've been using Upstart all year and they have all of the services that go with Upstart, including you know devices in the home, internet in the home. Um, they have a family education liaison who's a coach. So literally for those 30,000 families, it has been an absolute seamless transition and they've been able to just move forward and work. Um, our next is our 250,000 students who have been working in schools. And what's interesting about that is, is all of those schools and all of those students have had access to 
what we call home access, the ability to um, seamlessly go from school to home. So, so at any time over the last however many years, students have been able to use Waterford in the school and then um, have it at home and, and the, the data goes back and forth between the school and home. Only a fraction of schools had ever taken advantage of that. Um, you know, it, 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 I don't know, it was, there was an equity issue with it for sure. Um, there was also just, uh, you know, just the ease of, of being able to send information home to the parents and get the parents logged in. And, and I mean, we would, we would do all of that and support that, but it just felt like it was, it was something that wasn't necessary in the school setting. Well, and of course, in the last two weeks, that's become exceptionally necessary, right? So in the past two weeks, we really have transitioned almost all of our 250,000 users into a home setting. And it's been fairly easy in one, I mean, it's, it's easy technologically because the tools were already there and in place. Um, uh, what's, what's been interesting is the training and it's been kind of varied and it's been kind of evolving as we go through. Um, in that first week, we had, uh, we had schools who were able to just, with one small webinar, they're off and running and they're getting, and they're getting uh, their, their families up and running. And then uh, some needed a little more support than that. But what's happened in this last week, which I think is interesting, is we're starting to see, we're starting to see everyone sort of settle in. We've kind of gotten through um, the crisis part of it and they're trying to get, get back to business. So this week, um, the focus has really been on how do we interpret data and support? How do we track, how do we, how do we track the progress of the children? And so that's kind of been our, our um, we, we still have the webinars to help people get started, to help people do home access. But, you know, we had a webinar, I think the other day that had almost 400 people on it that was all about tracking data and support for children. And so that, you know, so that's been exciting to see, to see that we're, we're past the panic and we're into, okay, let's get to work. How do we, how do we make this happen? So if, if the both of you could answer that question, and so when you said you shifted them over, did you send, did you send specific devices over for people to sign on? Jeff, did your, did your students that you're serving already have things at home that were set up? And I think that's what people are asking, you know, yeah. how do you link on when you're in the middle yeah. of a rural area and you don't have internet? Or right. how do you link on for a SPED program I mean, you know, you guys have webinars on your websites. I hear that. And people can go and get advice and, and knowledge there. But can you talk briefly, quickly about what that transition looked like from yeah. maybe some other schools that are struggling, yeah. still don't have enough devices, don't have enough login yeah. or, uh, or devices to get onto the internet? Yeah, that's, that's something that we're providing directly to those families is that technology. We're trying to close that gap. Uh, when they come to us and they have those needs or that internet access, whatever it takes. Um, and, um, and so, and obviously with the IEPs, you know, there's, we, we, we will meet whatever, whatever it takes uh, to be able to meet the needs of, of, of those students and to fulfill those IEPs. So, you know, we are shipping technology directly to the students. We're providing that internet access directly to the students. We're providing the funds for them to be able to, to get that internet access if need be. Um, and then obviously the, uh, the, um, the special education services for whatever disability any student may have. And, and have you guys had to, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, but, but also have you guys had to adjust to where maybe a kid is using a phone instead of a computer or a knife or a, or a tablet or an iPad of some sort? Well, so for us, the adjustment to different devices hasn't been an issue because, you know, we, we, pretty much will run on, on any device and have support for that. Um, we, we are not providing, we're not providing the devices um, that has, has fallen to the school. What we're finding is that schools, uh, a couple of things. It's one thing, in, in certain cases, schools are, are ordering devices. And um, I, I, th I think that kind of the issue is gonna be down the road is how many Chromebooks are really out there today ready to to be ordered and deployed, so that so that becomes kind of a problem. If if every school in the country that ordered a Chromebook for a child who doesn't have one right now, we'd probably run out of Chromebooks during this crisis. Um, but I do know that schools are doing a lot to make sure that they can uh, that they can support kids. So they're looking at things like uh, they're doing they're doing um, 
surveys of their families, like direct surveys. Do you have a device? Do you have internet? And then trying to figure out if they if they've got something to support it. A lot of I've seen a lot of schools um, that that are almost one to one in their school district, but they haven't been sending those devices home, especially in my space with young children. And so yeah. now they're so now they are sending those home. I got a picture yesterday um, from from a school in Maryland where they said where it was the principal just texting me to say, hey, we're sending home our devices, you know, so yeah. um, so I know in certain cases they've ordered in other cases, they're redeploying devices that they already have into the home. Um, you know, but but a couple of things that we're doing to support too is that is that we're providing some other resources that could get to any parent. So we have a, a new program that just started on Monday called Waterford Boost. Um, it, and, and it provides a three time a week video lesson and, and activity that a child can do um, just so that, so that mom and dad have something you know, in their hands. If, if they have nothing else and they have a phone, they've got that. Okay, you know, three, let me, let me, let me narrow in. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ann, but, but you just said, so, so Jeff and Ann, Ann, answer this first. So you just said um, you're offering a new service. People don't have to have contracts with you guys to tap in to these solutions, right? Um, so in what age group yeah. was that program that you were just talking about? Because I know there's a ton of parents with pre-age kids who are yep. trying their best to get them to do it. So give me specifics. So yeah, that. so um, so water so waterford.org backslash boost, you just sign up and and information gets pushed pushed to the parents three days, three times a week. Lessons that'll probably take 20 to 30 minutes, three times a week for parents to do, and it just gets pushed directly to them. So waterford.org slash boost. Um, the other thing is, is, is by contacting Waterford at homeaccess.waterford.org um, for schools and districts, we are providing licenses uh, for free and, and these ongoing trainings for free for, you know, for basically any school and district that, that needs the support for K3 students. Um, so we're, we don't have a, we don't have a consumer model. So we don't have a way for like a parent to, to come in, it has to come through a school or district. But, but yeah, we're we're standing at the ready, and and we've already signed up about another about an additional thirty thousand students just in the last week or two weeks um, since we started making this offer. So, um, right. we're not we're we're not on all of the free lists out there, but we are. Uh, you know, if people know about us and can find us, um, we we really want to help. Um, and want to do it efficiently. So yeah. yeah so we Ryan, let me see. When you say free lists, um, and and I think uh, Jeannie, correct me if I'm wrong. We can make these free lists available. Do you have access to free lists that we can send out? Parents? There are some. Again, we wouldn't be on it, but there are there are a number of lists that are circulating with you know hundreds and hundreds of free resources for families. Um, there's a there's a Facebook page called school at home COVID-19 that also has like daily lessons and things they can do kind of in that K3 space. That's a Facebook page. Um, so school at home COVID-19. Um, and then, uh, and so those are, those are things that they can do without, you know, coming directly to us. Right. But then for schools and districts, they can come directly to us at homeaccess at waterford.org. Okay, and Jeff, going back to what what Ann was just saying, I mean, this is the, these programs are out there. Mm -hmm. Like online learning is out there. It, it's always been, and, and and it's probably pretty easy to find. But Jeff, you know, point to not just what K twelve is doing, but there's a lot of other companies out there. We're yeah, we're not here. It, to do this Waterford and K twelve yeah. free resources. So talk about that if you could, because we're getting a lot of questions from rural areas. Help us. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, you know, this has been a such a, a tragic and sort of national crisis, but it's also been, you know, really awesome to see the way in which ed tech providers and the online learning and space, the innovators in the field of education have really come together. Um, and, you know, we want to do our part as a company, K-12 as well, too. So, you know, those resources are probably almost too much right now. It's an avalanche. Right. Uh, and I know the challenge right now is for the communities to sort of try to filter that to find out specific needs and specific solutions. And so we're trying to do that as well on our end. And, um, you know, 
for, for us, we have, um, we have the capability to be able to serve uh, parents and families directly, to be able to serve educators uh, and teachers, and also to be able to serve school systems, school districts, or uh, other brick and mortar schools during this difficult period of time. So, you know, at k12.com backslash coronavirus, that's a whole list of things that we're doing as well too. Um, providing free content curriculum, eBooks, over 17,000 of them available. Um, we have uh, games and so forth that we're, that we're giving away for free as well too. And with school systems, we're offering platform content, teacher training, and specifically in those areas of, of, of how to you know, deal with the equity issues as well too, special education, for example, uh, to be able to provide uh, services to them free of charge for a period of time to get them through the remainder of these, uh, these, these, uh, these months of the school year. Um, and then, and then of course, webinars, lessons, and so on and so forth to help the, the teachers as well, too. But, but give me a website, Jeff. Give me yeah. something. We just sure. offered a whole lot, 15,000 ebooks. That's great. But yeah. give me a website. Where all of that, it? yeah, all of that can be found for, for, for us at k12.com backslash coronavirus. So okay. that's where we're offering it. But, uh, but again, I guess, you know, at the end of the day, and I know I speak for a lot of people in the community as well, too. We just want to do what's right for kids. We know that none, none of this was planned. Nobody expected this. Um, but we want to really step up right now and help uh, our peers in the traditional education system who are struggling, who got thrown into that deep end, as Michael Mo talked about, and, um, you know, are really trying to find their, their footing. Um, taking small steps to get to where they need to get to, to be sure. But we have... And I know many others do as well too, you know, solutions to these problems. So, you know, again, the message that I would say, and I know Jeannie's been really hammering on this, CER has been great. This is not a question of this, can it be done? Uh, I'm sorry, you know, if it can be done, it's a question of, of how it can be done and can and, and it will be done. And so I think it has to be And you know, I, I wanted to jump in here too, because this is a great conversation and I'm seeing attention, not just out there, but even in the questions, and we're watching all of you, and please keep this coming, the, the sort of the tension between people who don't know, like we live this on a daily basis, but there are leaders, representative staff of representatives that are, that are throwing in here, we're going to connect you with, there are people in, in the grassroots, there are leaders, and they don't know this stuff. So we forget that we're all in this you know, a little microcosm of like, we wake up to 5,000 Twitters and we think everybody knows what we're doing. We think because we're doing it, everybody else knows about it. So that's why we're getting really granular. There are not only tons of free products and services, but I'm just gonna go out on a limb here because that's why we brought you here. People can call Waterford. They can write to Waterford. If your district is not doing Waterford and you want kids to have this kind of amazing literacy instruction, we're gonna be talking about a little bit more in a few minutes with others, you can call and say, help me get my district. You guys, people out there have to pressure their districts and their leaders, but then there's also stuff that individual teachers and parents, right, can provide. Even with the bandwidth and the broadband issues we have, there's a lot you can do on paper. There's a lot you can do in your home as we're trying to push for these devices. And, and I just also answered somebody else's question and I'll stop talking and let you guys answer. But there's $30 billion coming to states from the federal government. Do not let those funds just go and sit somewhere. Mm -hmm. It is up to us to make sure those monies actually go to providing support for buying the devices and making sure that they're connecting you with people. I mean, there should be a freaking national hotline. We're doing what we can, but there should be a hotline that connects like Anne with the teacher somewhere or the district or right. K-12 with the school or the parent who wants to do something. So anyway, I'll shut up and, and let you guys yeah, And Jeannie, I was going to say, and just to your point, we are getting these questions um, from, from members of Congress staff and things, we will connect you all. We, we have the questions, we're not going to lose them. We will make sure they get answered. Um, and, and I can't, uh, just having worked on Capitol Hill in, in a lobbying capacity for over 25 years now, it's shocking to me when I see funds 
just sit in an account and then they get rolled back in. You guys have got to go to your SEAs. You guys have got to put pressure on your local districts to say, access these funds. They've been made available and you can buy these things. You can buy the, the home sign on, um, the, the assistance for getting Wi-Fi. And, and, um, and again, I just want to reiterate, we're not, you know, all, these companies, yes, have been putting offers up, but we have our own website, Jeannie, right? Ed Reform. Dot org, uh, and I, is it backslash COVID? And Michael, I think you make a great point there. Um, you know, uh, I, I've lost the, I, we, had, we had a big reform during the Obama years and it brought, you know, millions and millions of dollars to states. I, I wanna say race like- Race to the top. Race to the top, thank you. I just could not pull that out. I went into a race to the top uh, state two years after they had won about $45 million. The person who was over that said to me, we are two years in, we have spent $22 million and we have not served a child yet. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, so we have to be careful that these funds don't go into, into a, you know, a bureaucratic mix and become a jobs program. They've got to go and serve these families and these children and get them up and ready and going uh, to be able to to have these experiences because education changed two weeks ago and it's going and that change right. is here to stay. Um, right. I think people like Jeff, people like me, I know Jeannie, Michael, Michael Mo, especially. You know, we've been on this path. I started in ed tech in 1998, coming out of a classroom. I thought, oh, in five years things are going to look different. You know, here we are, 22 years later. I think that difference happened two weeks ago and we're gonna see the things that we've all been working towards for all of this time when it comes to personalization, um, using, using ed tech, perhaps grade bands changing. I love Victor Lee's question, do we think internet access is gonna become a public utility? You know, I, I think all of these things are changing and they are gonna happen at breakneck speed to a point that that you know even even us that are in the middle of it um, are not are are going to be surprised by the speed that it's happening, but yeah. luckily the work that's happened in this in this industry has allowed has allowed the industry to be ready for this change, and yeah. that's and what's been exciting to me. The, and there's also the technology out there. I interviewed someone for my podcast the other day. It's not out yet. The head of Kajit. You know, there, there, there are, yes. there is, is bandwidth in a box. I know, Anne, yes. you guys use it. I know K-12. We, we are just starting with Khajiit. We're so excited. Yeah. And, and so basically something the size of a hockey puck can be put in your, in your room, in your home. And so parents can access that. And I, I learned about it last week, which is why mm -hmm. I interviewed the guy. So there are all sorts of other devices and ways to access information that we need to make sure that the departments of the world, the agencies, the congressional police, the governors, and others um, are really are making are making sure and, that happens. And, and, and add a quick final thought. Um, Go ahead. Because, uh, yeah, you know, we, we've been toiling in this field for 20 years, just trying to justify the existence of online learning and online schools, and here we are now thrust on everybody. Um, and so, you know, it is really a time for us to step up in, in, in a leadership capacity to be able to be a guide and, and so forth. I, I will say this, I'm seeing some, some early good signs. I had a great conversation with a very innovative authorizer um, a couple of days ago who said that they're, when they, when they, they're expecting those funds as well too, and when they receive those funds, they're going to make it um, a bit online learning a part of their uh, charter across all of their schools. They want to make this so that it never happens again, so that everybody's fully prepared and that we can integrate that into the daily uh, instruction that takes place with the students in the brick and mortar schools, but they will be fully prepared. Teachers will be ready trained to be able to ensure that this type of uh, crisis, should it happen again, it will not impact continuity of learning. So that's, I think, you know, again, uh, when you talk about the federal funds or, or the resources that come in, that this isn't just a one stop, buy a bunch of stuff and put it on the shelf, but that it's integrated as part of the learning that takes place for students uh, in whatever model that they're in. And, and this goes back to the fact that we looked at and, and, and it takes a crisis like this to make the next big jump, right? It takes the crisis to push it to where 
every kid in the United States. And again, we got to get over this. Oh my gosh, there are for profit come there are not for profit. We need solutions right now. We don't have time to, to quibble because there are rural kids, there are low income kids, there are minority kids, there are, you know, wealthy kids who, who don't still, whatever the reason may be, don't have access to things, right? So let's get over our little hangups right now during this crisis. Let's get tools like Khajiit offers, like you offer, like all those companies that are out there. And, and we have a website, you can go to it on edreform.org that, that's putting resources down, that's giving the bright ideas, that's giving the resources that are out there. And it's just, it's time to like seriously say to all of these local governments, these county governments, state and federal government, we got to move on. It's the 21st century. We don't have time to continue to fight about these things. If we are failing children, it's because we're not using the tools that have been available for years. So if you can't reach someone, are you kidding me? I mean, come on. Well, I agree. And I will say this again as well, too, you know, it's sort of what I started off with, which is, you know, for every situation, whether it's a student in a rural area, uh, students who are low income, urban areas, suburban areas, uh, special education students, those students are being well served right now. Those types of students are being well served right now through online learning, through, through uh, uh, programs like Waterford and K-12 and the schools that we serve. And so there's models out there. So, um, you know, I, I just hope that, you know, I know we had a tough two weeks as there was a lot of paralysis taking place across many states and school districts. But I hope now that th that's turning and that the focus now is a sort of a can-do attitude, looking towards the models that, that uh, have been working, that have been serving students, especially those who are um, uh, that, you know, with less means. Um, and that we can also sort of build again, as Michael, you said, that public-private partnership and get over kind of the hangups, political and ideological, divides that that exist in education so that we can get to solutions and start uh making sure that students are learning well and and real quick i'm gonna and go ahead and then uh, okay. i'm gonna let you uh have a, a 20 seconds in and then i, I just gonna want to make a point okay. um that's critical and it goes back to how do you get these money how do you get these things unlocked so that they just don't sit in account somewhere. So Ann, go ahead and wrap up a little bit because we're just, coming up on our time. Just as the ed tech community, Waterford, you know, K-12, Waterford, we've got this for you. You know, we, we have been preparing for this moment for 20 years in this community and schools, you know, trust us, rely on us. Um, Jeff's organization, I'm sure has has scads of research we have scads of research we know that if children use our programs that they're learning and they're getting to the next level and they're and they're working and so so rely on that rely on the fact that we have you know that we've already been awarded federal grants and philanthropic grants and they've done the research to prove that that our research is sound and so you know let us help you and let us be there for you because we're they we're we're ready for you. We're we're yeah. ready to take on this challenge. Yeah, and, listen, and, Michael. Yeah. Before you say anything, I just also want to. I, I just want to also um, bring up the 500-pound gorilla that some people, not everybody, I think a lot of people out there are um, very much grounded in. How do we just get this done? First of all, everyone on this um, webinar is offering their services, their support for free. And, and, and that's critical. So whether you're like Waterford, that's a nonprofit or K-12, that's a tax paying company and for, considered a for-profit, it really doesn't matter because there are millions of teachers and thousands of parents out there who are literally trying to get a hold of solutions and want ideas and help. Should America pay for it at some point in time, no matter what you are, yes. But right now, we're just trying to make sure that everyone out there has a connected, is connected to someone else. And um, the lack of information, the connectivity on this is stunning because we have relied for years on 15,000 school districts to tell us how to do education. And so when we're suddenly faced um, with doing it ourselves, um, we have an issue. And so I just wanted to bring that up. And yeah, and Jeannie, before we go to, we, we have someone who, who is a leader in this world that we want to get a question from. Uh, but I want, I want to say to your point, now that these parents and these teachers are all forced into it, 
uh, you all need to join together and start blasting emails to your state and local representatives, whether it's your mayor, whether it's a chair of an education committee for your Senate or your House, uh, House of Delegates or House of Representatives state level, whether it's your congressman. That's where these messages have to go. You have got to start flooding their office saying, why have we never used these solutions to reach these kids before? Right, and, and it's, it, it is an agenda. It's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's not for-profit or not-profit. It is a parent-teacher agenda for getting tools into the hands of people that now have to use them, right? Oh my gosh, I gotta teach my kid. Why were all these things available and we've never known about them? Why do we not know about the little plug-in hockey puck thing that will give me Wi-Fi? So with that, um, and, and it's critical, and, 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 and we, can, we can go back to telling you how to get in touch with um, your elected officials, but I want to recognize Howard Fuller, who is a phenomenal nationwide civil rights leader who I have had the honor and the privilege of, of working with over the years. Howard, I think you have something that you wanted to put out. Yeah, no, first of all, uh, Michael and Jeannie and all of the, the guests, I, I really appreciate um, being able to be a part of this. One of the things you all know that's happening is all over the country, there are small groups of people who are meeting, trying to figure out how to, you know, how to help. So in the city of Milwaukee, for example, uh, about five or six days ago, there was a call with about 87 black people representing all kinds of different entities. And they were trying to talk about the basic issues like how do we keep people alive? Because in Milwaukee right now, for example, the epicenter for the, the disease is the black community. But there also was a discussion about education. And so then another work group is coming out of that conversation to talk about education. So the question that I had posed and Jeannie responded to it is that you all are listing a lot of companies that people have never heard of. And so one of the things I wanted to try to do is to get a list of those companies and what it is that they provide so I can go back on the, on the phone calls with these small work groups to give them that information because they will get it to people who will never hear from, you know, uh, a, you know, thing like like what we're doing here. You know, people. And and the second part of this is that what I've been saying to people is, this is an opportunity to use other schools, for example, and other schools that have access to people to their their families. Like our school is going to have a virtual town hall meeting with our families tonight. Our families will listen to us, but they're not going to access these other websites that people are talking about because they don't, they don't have any, <laughs> any knowledge of it, right? So one of the things is to try to figure out how individual schools who do have access to parents, how they'll be able to pass on all of this information. So again, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to be on this, uh, uh, this program. Great. Thank you, Howard. And with that, and Jeff, we are going to uh, thank you so much for your, uh, for your advice today. And again, you are offering free stuff right now, right? It is on your web. We are not sitting here pushing just for companies to profit. This is practical tools that families oh, can... Oh, we'll get criticized anyway, Michael. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, matter right? Again. <laughs> We're just trying to offer solutions and we really appreciate the both of you. Uh, we're gonna get up here to our next panel. Jeannie, uh, you wanna take it away? Thank you, Ann and Jeff again. Thank you all. I am uh, so happy. I now have uh, Janine Caffrey and Jamie Height with me. Um, Janine is the head of LexFloor uh, and Jamie is the head of, oh, some, for some reason, Jamie, you have LexFloor on your name. Who knows, we'll, we'll rename you. Um, but um, CER team, let me have spotlight please on this uh, fantastic panel. So we wanna make sure that you guys uh, talking about going granular, Jamie uh, basically took his brain uh, as a writing um, and literature expert, professor extraordinaire and put it in a technology that allows you to help manage uh, writing. I probably did not describe that nearly as well. Lexplore has similar really interesting AI 
um, behind it, artificial intelligence. And they are two of the people who have been out there also with their tools and products, offering it, helping and coaching. And if you're doing anything at home or in a district, you're gonna want people to keep moving forward on literacy and writing. And so they are our panel. Jamie, um, let me just go ahead and sort of jump in and start with you, if you don't mind. I would love to know what are the challenges for writing instruction that COVID's causing and how specifically can you help and no theorizing about what we are doing or not doing? <laughs> oh, I'm a philosopher by training. I like to theorize, so this will be, I'll have to scramble my notes in my brain. Uh, thanks for having me. This has been really enjoyable so far. I appreciate the, the privilege of being amongst such thoughtful people. So yeah, the challenges for writing are, it, it's kind of like an extra set of challenges on top of a obviously massive challenge with this COVID catastrophe we're dealing with. And that's that writing is labor intensive to learn and students need that kind of focused attention with what they do, right? They go home, they write the paper, the teacher's gonna help them understand if they did a good job or not. So if students are not in schools, how do you replicate that face-to-face -face dynamic? And you know, my fun stat that I've settled on with respect to the scope of this problem is that in the spring semester, the amount of time spent grading for all the papers that should get written is the equivalent of roughly 150 years of human time. And the amount of face-to-face -face engagement with students that will occur in the classroom is about 100 years. So set aside the grading uh, weight for just a second. How do you replace 100 years worth of time when you're not allowed to meet anywhere? And that's, uh, th that's what a CREE does. It provides something that mirrors that human engagement with students, and it can deliver that engagement to the end user. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of questions about accessing this platform or the service. We built a Cree to be accessible from any device. So how do you get to a Cree? You use your phone and uh, a shocking number of students actually do punch out long form essays on their phone. I still don't understand that, but uh, I'm a bit further on in age, I suppose. Uh, so my own shortcoming, but uh, it, there's unique challenges in writing instruction. And that's what ICRI is here to talk about, is that we have a unique solution and a powerful solution to fill in that specific gap. And Jamie, sorry to take myself on mute. So what age groups are you getting? Are you talking to parents? Are you talking to teachers? Is it just ICRI to students? Can they download it? Tell us, tell us if I need that right now, what do I have to do? So if you are a student, you go to accree.com and create an account and it will be free for the rest of the spring. You can click a button. You know, I'm writing an essay on Romeo and Juliet. So I click the button saying, start my essay. I type in my question, discuss love and Romeo and Juliet. And there you go. At a, a, it's that simple. We've made the technology is easy to use as possible and as self-directed as possible. If you're a teacher or a parent or an administrator, you can tell your students to do what I just said that you, the student should do. If you have more questions about integration at a broader level, uh, of course, feel free to reach out. Uh, you know, as with the other experts, we spend a lot of time thinking about these sorts of questions and I'm more than happy to to get on the phone with anybody. It's uh, happy to share the knowledge and work together to explore ways that you can integrate this technology into a, a broader context like a learning management system or district platform, et cetera. Okay, and I'm gonna come back to you in a minute to talk to you um, a little bit more about how, kind of demystify how it works. Like how can I really learn to write if I'm not standing next to my teacher? But I wanna bring um, Janine in uh, to talk about, Janine, what you're seeing in um, what's happening right now, what specifically you know, does Lexplore do, who are you serving, how can other people think about Howard Fuller's example of the parents and teachers in Milwaukee, um, what do we need to know? Yeah, so thanks for having me, Jeannie. And the, the kind of motto we're operating by right now is do everything from where you are with what you have. And so we are working on helping parents. Um, all of us at Lexplore are finding ourselves in, or almost all of us have children at home. I am homeschooling my six-year-old granddaughter who is learning to read right now. Uh, so being a, 
uh, a, a grandparent in this situation has been um, really interesting for me. Uh, what I learned very quickly is that six-year-olds really can't handle Zoom teaching very well at all. And I'm uh, talking with a lot of my teacher friends, realize, they've realized the same thing. You, you can't do a Zoom class lesson with five and six-year-olds. It, it just doesn't work. And so what we're doing at Lexplore is we are helping parents with like little bite-sized tips for being that home educator. Um, how do you get your schedule set up? How do you allow kids for uh, ways to have brain breaks and those kinds of things? And um, what can you do at home? So we provide those basic tips. And then beyond that, we have a wonderful teacher named Janet Pedrazzi, who is providing online um, training for parents to be the educators of their children. So how to teach them blending words, how to teach them phonemic awareness, those kinds of things uh, to make sure that parents have tools that they can use. And we are seeing schools doing some wonderful things of repurposing tools that they have. For example, my granddaughter's school, they um, use Class Dojo to do morning announcements now. And um, they are using, they're taking the tools that they've already been using in the classroom. They happen to be using foundations in their classroom. And so those tools that are normally teacher tools, they are now sharing with parents on their school's website. Can you um, say so a few minutes about those specific tools? So Class Dojo, sure and foundations so so class dojo um normally is used for parent communication of as as, as a safe um way to text back and forth with parents so what my uh, my granddaughter jane's school is doing is they're they're using that as their main tool for helping to communicate with parents on a daily basis and so the principal every day has a little video of what normally would be closed caption in the in the school itself now is on class dojo so he does the pledge of allegiance he holds a little flag in front of it he does the joke of the day and the weather and i can't tell you how important that is jane's face just lights up when she sees her principal every morning because you know everything's different the whole world's upside down but there's mr beaumont and he's still doing the pledge and you know that's how she's normally starts she's her watching thing. him on facebook how is she watching him she watches him on the app on Class Dojo. On the app yep. itself. Which on the app phone. itself. You can be on a phone. You can, doesn't matter. Doesn't right? matter. We do it on the phone. We do it on the laptop. Whatever we have. Um, so, so Class Dojo has been really important. Foundations, which a lot of schools already use, they have tools for teachers. They have videos. They have worksheets. They have little. Um, uh, phonemic awareness tools that they use, and those can be made available for parents. So if you're a parent out there and you haven't gotten access to those kinds of things, you should be demanding that. Uh, we're lucky in that Jane's school has just uploaded all of that stuff right on their website so uh, parents can get a hold of the videos and the, and the instructional materials that they need in order to teach the kids. And then the other thing I'll say that's really super important is that they're using those tools as a little bit of a, a tracking of, of who needs what. And so, for example, this week, the kids are working on silent E. And so every day there's a different letter that uses the silent E and you have to post a picture. You're supposed to po post a picture of your child just um, doing this one little activity. And that allows the teacher to figure out, okay, who needs my help? So she knows Jane's fine, <laughs> but there's, there might be another child in Jane's class who's, who doesn't have a parent at home who's doing these things. So, so the teacher can directly reach out to those parents who really need help. And, and again, demystify it for us. And I want to go br bring Jamie back in. How does this specifically work? So if I'm going, you know, and it's fantastic to hear the perspective about some of the other tools. And again, to Howard's recommendation, we'll kind of combine these. But how does it specifically work with Lexplore with the tools that you have? Can I use Lexplore to teach my child to read? Can I make a connection between the district and people in my community? can't, you know, where, where do we take this? Because we also have to be creating our own spaces and our own groups at this point. Right. In time. Right. So we're trying to integrate with all of the other tools that are out there. And so what we're doing at Lexplore is uh, this collection of videos that appear on our social media sites. Parents can go on and they can learn how to teach their kids at home. 
um, through the content that we've developed at Lexplore. Looking forward, the AD part of this, what we are very excited about is that we're going to be able to help states and districts and individual schools and parents understand where their kids are. Because think about this, in most schools, they're not going to be in session for the rest of the year. Most state assessments have been canceled. So what happens at the beginning of next school year? And we need to know where all these kiddos are. How many kids are struggling with reading? Reading has already been this huge challenge. We already know we're way behind. Well, what are we going to do at the beginning of the next school year? So, so we're able to offer a solution that gives a really quick reading assessment in just a couple of minutes of where kids are going to be. And so our outreach in the next few months is going to be, we're, we're we're waiting until everyone is kind of past this initial phase of, of sinking <laughs> and trying to swim. And, and we want to help with the planning process for next year, figuring out where these kids are and providing some structured ways of getting everybody on the right track. That's great, Janine. And Jamie, what's your, what's your sense of kind of what you're hearing and seeing on this are you optimistic? Are you, um, you know, do you, and, and, and what are the specific things that people need to know in your estimation from an educator perspective, from a professor perspective, that they can take home with them, so to speak? So I am optimistic. That's by nature, but also in times of crisis, we tend to figure things out and it's actually, we, we have a big head start with respect to education because there are so many tremendous tools already out there. If the challenge is more, how do we fit them together and how do we get them to as many people as possible? That's great because then we don't have to build the tools from scratch, right? We have the resources. Now we have to marshal them in an effective way. Uh, so I am optimistic. The thing I... I, I've been keeping an eye on certainly from an accrue perspective, but also from a teacher perspective and the perspective as a parent watching my girls make a very, very quick transition uh, is that a lot of the initial steps that are being taken and they're obvious to take are, are content driven. So let's get resources to students, right? That can be digital, that can be actual notebooks that have been printed off as is the case here in Durham, but content is part of the learning cycle. It's not the learning cycle in full. And that's what I find myself talking about a lot with respect to how does a Cree fit into this equation? And I say, well, you know, simplistically think of four steps. You've got presentation, practice, assessment, and feedback, right? You present the content to a student. The student goes home and does some sort of homework or exercise. That's the practice that work is assessed by a human and this is where things really start to break down uh, because that's where the scale requirements of the system kind of get harder to uh, mirror digitally and then of course you need that feedback students need to know did i do a good job did i not do a good job and how do i fix these sorts of things so that's what i worry about uh, worry is not quite the right word but i keep my eye on in the sense of keeping the sort of overall uh, sound pedagogy, sound learning psychology in place as we think about individual components of the process. We need to make sure that we're completing the loop, as I like to say. Uh, you know, I tell the story often of my mom's family cinnamon roll recipe, and I cannot make them. I've tried so many stinking times, and I can't get the recipe right. And it's a recipe, right? There's clear guidelines on what to do, but I make a mistake. And you know the feedback component of learning that I need is for my mother to be in the kitchen to watch me and say, Jamie, here's exactly what you did. If you can inject that piece of engagement into the learning process, what am I gonna be able to do next time I try to make those cinnamon rolls? I'll get it right. But without that intervention, you have students flying blind. You have parents trying to remember things. I was working with my daughter on long division. I was like trying to dust off this part of my brain that I haven't used in goodness knows how long because I use a calculator. And I, you know, so technology is okay as an aside, right? Once you learn the skill, I told this to my daughter, go use the calculator, but learn the skill before you rely on the technological crutch. Uh, but you know, there's, again, layers upon layers of things to account for. What you're saying is you don't have to be that expert. And I think this is one of the things that yeah. 
Um, and there's a question I want to kind of bring in uh, about parents who don't have time to navigate all this. How do you keep them falling through the cracks? I think there's two levels of thought. There's like, isn't this great? There's all these resources and parents who have time can teach them. But there's another one that we've actually, I know both of you are big fans of student agency, that students actually do learn on their own if they have some tools and some structure. So it doesn't mean you have to be doing the long division. If you happen to have the time, if you happen to have the job that you can do it, if you happen to like it, but that students given the ability to truly explore, we'll be talking to Ulrich Christensen in a few minutes about adaptive learning, what we're seeing, whether you look at that, that experiment years ago in India by Sukhata Mutra, where he put the computer in a wall in the poorest part of India, and little children came up and started coding together, right? The hole in the wall, yeah. the in the wall thing, right? right? Personalized, individualized learning has to bank on the fact that our kids are already digital natives. Even the poorest of kids know how to work around technology. And so how do you address this concern about kids that don't have anyone standing over them, um, don't have the encouragement, don't have the math brain scientist or the technology parent like you, like in other words, the majority of us, um, where, do we, where do we fill that gap? So I like to tell the story of Maria uh, to speak to this kind of question. And I should uh, frame Maria's story to come back to a question that came up earlier that I realized I didn't address, which is skill level for a Cree. Uh, we start seeing real impact starting in grade six, uh, from grade six to grade 12, what we're giving feedback on is strongly standards aligned. And I can literally provide you charts <laughs> saying, here's how we map to TEKS, here's how we map to STAR. Uh, but Maria was a freshman at a high school out, uh, in the Houston Independent School District. Uh, she's on reduced lunch. So by any number of demographic markers, she should not be a candidate for success, right? And with almost no guidance from her instructor, her paper that came in as an F ended up as a 97. She currently holds the record for most distinct drafts completed on a single assignment with 94. And we gave her the technology. Right? We didn't sit her down for hours and hours and say, here's how you do this, then do this. We just gave them access and look what happens, right? One, students are digital natives, so they understand things and they will naturally navigate through platforms. And two, students are incredibly hungry if you give them support and things that are specifically helpful. And you know, three, students are humans and like all of us, they're gonna adapt and excel if they have the right resources. Uh, people understand what's going on and give them good stuff, they're gonna solve problems probably faster than we all expect. Are you getting people asking you to help you do that? Exact, precisely that, give me the information, give me the tools? Uh, yeah, we, uh, I'm pretty busy for sure because um, we provide help for something that is a crucial part of education, especially for K-12 students. And as I mentioned earlier, I really am happy to help, you know, drop me a note. Uh, I'm, we'll find time to chat. It might be a couple of days because there's only so many hours in the day. I wish I could scale. I don't, uh, but happy to get on the phone and, and share what we have learned and how we think about things. Uh, all hands on deck sort of approaches how I think about the crisis. Absolutely. Janine, what's your take on what we were just talking about, kind of access and kids and what are we doing for, the, you know, equity keeps coming up and it should, and we have to solve it. Is there a but? Is there an and? Uh, well, I've, I've seen some really wonderful examples of that lately. A uh, couple of schools in Newark, uh, I, I, and I can't point you directly to them because I've been reading so much about different places, but a couple of schools in Newark, New Jersey, um, high poverty school district, and they're pairing families together who, you know, maybe there's a really good reader in one family um, that is helping another one. So as I said before, five and six-year-olds don't do well in a group Zoom class with a teacher. They do really well paired individually with one other student, maybe a little older, a little further along in the reading development process. So that's happening. Uh, reading Horizons, which is a wonderful reading company, they, uh, on their Facebook page, it's a 
uh, page that I subscribe to and I found there are children who are doing video lessons for other children on their website, which is really, really cool. Um, so we have kind of these little one room schoolhouses in a lot of our families that have multiple children or maybe neighbors have banded together, you know, in a limited way that they can, or families through technology are working with one another. Um, there are students at MIT, for example, who are providing free tutoring. So anytime that you have heterogeneous groupings of children who have a little bit higher level skills than other children, having them tutor each other, that's the best way anyway. Heterogeneous groupings we know work better than homogeneous groupings. So this is a great time to lean into some of that research and get kids to help one another learn the things that they do want to learn. Do you think it's possible, um, and, and what do you, I have two questions. Do you think it's possible for students to make progress in this difficult time? And my second slightly related question is, what do you know, given that you're in that ed tech sort of delivery world, what do you know about other companies are the, and groups and organizations that are helping? Do you feel like, is that somehow connected to the first question? Hmm. Um, yes, uh, I, I think they are all helping. Um, I think the strange thing that's going to come out of this is that we're going to find some children making more progress during this time than they would have in a traditional school setting. And what I keep thinking about is what happens when kids who kind of skyrocket in terms of their academic potential come back to school and at the same time you've got other kids who are already lagging who didn't get the support at home that they, that they needed. So I think we're going to see some strange gaps forming. We're going to have kids at the high end of the spectrum, so the kids maybe in the gifted group um, are going to come back to school reading at a fifth grade level when they're in second grade or doing algebra when they're only in sixth grade um, because they could. And so now we have this place that, that although none of us really wants to be isolated, you've got children who are dealing with this myriad of bullying and social issues in school. And now suddenly they're sheltered from all of that and they can just focus on their academics. And you're going to see their academic skills go through the roof. Whereas other children who have been struggling along academically, if they don't get the support at home, maybe they fall by the wayside. Um, part so of that, stay on that for two seconds, yeah. part of that really, and I've been reading some comments about this from parents and teachers around, is, is uh, one parent actually said on a, on a Twitter thing the other day, a conversation, whatever you call it, like she didn't realize how much time was actually wasted during the day. And right. so this isn't to criticize everything, but we all, we all feel this way, right? I mean, we know that, that the education system, 150 plus years old, is still structured around a certain cadence. And so part of what we enjoy about school, if you like school, is the socializing, is the in-between classes. But right. what you do like is waiting for someone to answer a question or being struggling with your own question or having to deal with, as your teacher, all these kids and all these different levels. And so to your point, a lot of kind of purposeful education, whether it's happening individually or by a leader, a teacher, a person in front of you is much more efficient, some people think. Sure. Unless you happen to be special needs, ELL, and don't have that person, although a dear friend of mine is a special needs teacher, she's talking to her kids every day and giving them big hugs over the phone, and I'm really excited about the progress they're making. Well, and even with, you know, I'm a special ed teacher myself, and I can tell you that I can, I can think of a lot of my kids over the years that it would be so much easier to teach them this way. So I did home education for part of my career as well. And I found that the academic kids, the academic gains I was able to make with special needs kids in an isolated setting were much bigger than in the group setting um, because you're not having to navigate the social emotional stuff uh, that you have to you navigate when you have groups of children in a classroom. Um, so it can go both ways. I, I, I'm hoping what comes out of this is parents are going to really raise their voices 
in a very big way because now they know. I know what, what my kid can do and I know what my kid can't do. I know what you're providing and what you're not providing. I know what this curriculum should be because I've had to research it for the last five months. And so I'm really, really hoping that this is a springboard for parents to start making the kinds of demands of our educational system that they should be. Jamie, what do you think? Uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure I can add much. It was all said so well just then. So uh, yeah, I'll just say I, I agree that this is gonna lead to good change and it's going to draw stakeholders in who aren't either thinking about what education should look like moving forward or are only thinking about it to some degree. Yeah, the, we talk a lot at Acree about balance. You know, we, a lot of folks will ask us, are you just trying to make the teachers irrelevant? And I always say, absolutely not. What we're trying to do is leverage the best of technology to combine with the best of what teachers can offer. And that's really the framework in my mind for how to work with individual students all the way up to these macro questions. What does education look like moving forward? And responding to, adapting to the things that we're being forced to think about in this very acute sense is uh, sort of directionally where I see all of this going and I remain optimistic that the, the result will be good. As you draw more people in, as you get people more engaged, that tends to produce good outcomes um, and better paradigms for, for success moving forward. And uh, Jeannie, I just wanted to, to kick in here um, to enter the uh, Q&A period. Before we enter the Q&A, I just want to say I, I had my beard prior to this situation. Jamie, I'm loving it. Uh, you <laughs> look like very much Senex, the wise old man in the cave who we go to every now and then. <laughs> and Jamie, uh, thank you. Uh, the two of you have touched on something because we're getting a lot of thank yous. We're getting a lot of thank you for pointing these things out. Thank you for explaining that students can learn without having someone standing there. Thank you for the practical examples of how special uh, needs children can learn. And, and I think, you know, just for me alone, um, being on phone calls all day is very different from being able to go and take a walk when you're in the office after a meeting, just to clear your head and it's kind of hitting like this. Um, and so I can, I can see, I, I have a 15 year old daughter. I have a, a 10 year, a, 10, 12 year old son, um, who both are learning online. It was easy for their schools to adapt. Uh, I know that's not the case, but watching them uh, adapt how they have to deliver final products and how they have to be a little more uh, innovative, but they're the ones that are thinking of it. I, you know, I'm not there saying, well, you know what you should really do? They're coming up with things. So um, I, I, I think you're right. Um, and, and I wanted to make sure that we get to, to questions, um, folks. Um, do we have questions out there? We have, uh, yeah, we have so, so, so one of them was, um, what's the platform you recommend, Janine, where students can pair up, work together without the teacher? That was one I think that was not done. Yeah. Oh, so it wasn't really a platform. It was a, it was a school that was um, pairing children so that what the teachers are looking at who's doing really well and who is struggling and the teachers are pairing up families. So I would say if you're, if you're a parent in this situation, uh, reach out to your child's teacher or reach out to the principal of the school and say, my kid's struggling in math. Is there someone, can, oh, uh, who can help me? The university I mentioned is helping high schoolers is MIT. Which, which is it? MIT. MIT, okay, great. I think Harvard might be doing it as well, okay. but uh, yeah, MIT specifically. Okay, that's great. And um, there's lots of other things. Just this one other comment. Um, in what ways can universities, particularly large universities, assist K-12 with the pedagogical issue with the shift to online? Great question, because we know higher education has been doing this for a while, right? Jamie, you cut your teeth in higher ed. Um, Janine, you've been involved for a long time. What are ways that maybe higher ed can demystify this? And part of this, again, is I think it's really hard for people, and we've seen this up close when we talk to a, you know, a lot of lawmakers, to actually think about how you can learn to write online. Like it doesn't make sense if someone's not scratching through your paper or saying, put CV for this and 
you know, this is your grammar rule. So I think that's part of it is people think, yeah, obviously you have to be more educated, more fluent, more able to do it. But that's not what our lesson was in higher ed, right? Right. So that I, I, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is seat time. Uh, one of the barriers to ed reform, uh, particularly at the high school level, has been seat time. And seat time is, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's like how many minutes a week a kid has to be in a seat in order for that to count, how many minutes a day an elementary schooler has to be in a seat in order for that to count for a day of attendance, and suddenly that's all out the window. We don't even think about that anymore. Um, so what's going to be important in our AD world is to get post-secondary schools and K-12 to to talk together, which they very seldom do, and think about um, what requirements we're going to put in place in order for kids to come to colleges and universities, and what requirements we're going to put in place in order for children to complete a school year, to complete high school, and really rethink this whole idea of seat time, Carnegie units, and all of those things so we can focus on what kids are learning rather than how long their, their butts are in chairs. Excuse my language, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's really what language is cleaner than mine might have been. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so you know, seat time and number of pages needed, it, it's interesting with writing, there's actually a designated number of pages in higher education that students need to complete for a course to maintain their skill level. And obviously you want to do more than that so that they build the skill level. You know, and that matters for a lot of different reasons, but in practice on the ground, uh, you, what I learned very quickly when I was teaching in the classroom is, have them do the thing more often and they will get better on average. <laughs> we practice. Right. Uh, if you want to learn to play the piano and you practice once a week or once a month, you're probably not gonna be a good piano player. Uh, I know that because I tried to teach myself to help my girls learn piano and they've outpaced me by a good stretch. Uh, get them to work. And this is one of those, uh, just by virtue of what higher education is, it more naturally pushes students to go off and do stuff and then come back because they're not in class every day at the same time. They tend to be a couple of times a week with a lot of free time and an obligation to spend uh, that time practicing at least to some degree for their different subjects. Uh, so you know, get them to work and provide that engagement, which again is what we sort of model the CREA on. How do you just give some basic feedback loops that will help students get even more out of that practice. Uh, and then the other thing that I would add to the K-12 higher ed conversation, because we have it a lot at Accree because uh, you know everyone in higher ed blames everybody in K-12 and then high schoolers blame middle schoolers and middle schoolers blame higher ed. It's a, uh, the different, it's really tough to say whose fault it is and that's obviously the wrong question. Uh, what's more interesting and what I tend to do to kind of calibrate these discussions is emphasize sort of the commonality that all of these different segments that are so easily siloed are uh, working on together and writing is a great example, right? Sixth grade standards for North Carolina's state tests look an awful lot like the rubric for my intro to philosophy classes that I used to teach up in Princeton. You know, the core skills are the same, the complexity changes, but reminding folks that not only are we in this together, but we're working on the same type of stuff. It's a continuum there. You don't chop up the line and then refuse to look over the wall. Understand that we're all on sort of the same trajectory and students should not be thought of as individuals that stop learning or go through this major transition between grade eight and nine. Right? They don't well, stop and think in that way. So we should not think in that way. And I think that, the, that there is a, there's an equal interest, if you will, in both how do we do this, how do we get it done, and these policy questions of seat time. Will that ever go away? How do we get the money to flow? I mean, we're so we're, we're sitting, we're seeing this in the chat, we're seeing these conversations. I mean, we have to be honest. I think, again, as I said a little earlier, um, this is the first time real live rank and file educators and parents have seen the system kind of and what it actually does or doesn't do and there is a huge tension we've been seeing it written about in lots of papers we've written about it we've treated about it ad nauseum 
there are states and districts right now have said no remote learning and it doesn't count. You know, there's a teacher that, you know, sent a note to my daughter last night saying that I had to call 33 parents to tell them that their kids had not handed in their non-graded, non-essential work. Well, what do you expect, <laughs> right? If it's non-essential and non-graded, my kid's not gonna do it. The most motivated kid's not gonna do it. And so part of this is policy issues not demanding having districts that aren't looking at the tools and services because Lord knows they have enough people that can get online like we are now. And I'm just being really blunt. And then there are districts and states like Gina Raimondo in Rhode Island who said, we're open for business. We're gonna educate our kids no matter what. And she absolutely expects that people are gonna be doing it. So you have, how will we change the fact that right now we're not in classes and we'll see time ever really go back to what it was, which is we're counting butts in chairs versus are we gonna learn about this learning process in a better way so that there's actually more power on the part of rank and file educators and parents to do something. It doesn't mean they have to all turn into experts, right? But we have to surface these issues now, not because we are abusing this situation, but because this situation is a result of not being prepared for transformative education. And on that note, okay. we uh, Janine, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us as well. Your, your knowledge, experience, and practical solutions have been extremely helpful to everyone on board. Um, and thank you so much. And I know that you're going to hang around for a little bit and still continue to throw up some resources and, and things like that. And we are, Jeannie, moving on to Ulrich Christensen because I know there is a huge amount of stress, anxiety, not just on the side of a student of these children who are now learning primary at home, but on parents as well. And so uh, Christia, Ulrich Christensen is going to speak a little bit to that. Jeannie, take it away. Yeah, so I'm so glad, Ulrich, you are with us today. Thank you so much. Um, very exciting. We have had so many challenges out there um, that we've been covering, and I know your area is brain science. Um, you've done a lot of adaptive learning, but one of the things you said to us when we engaged you in this, and for those of you who don't know, and again, you can look at their information on our website. Ulrich um, is, a, is a brain scientist, if you will. He's a medical doctor. He moved into education to help demonstrate that there were better, um, more impactful ways to learn. Um, but the given he's also done a lot on brain science, we wanted to talk a little about the stress that um, on the brain, because this is stressful, not just for parents and educators, but for students. So one of the things I just really thought, and I want to kind of turn it over to you all, Rick, is for you to share like how the learning can be working for students, but also that contrast, or if you will, that compatible concern, are we stressing out our kids, our parents, our teachers too much? Thank you for joining sure. us. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Um, and when you originally proposed the title, I was about to correct it. And then I thought, well, it might actually be a really good opportunity to have a, have a, a quick conversation about what is actually brain science and what is not. So despite the fact that I used to teach this and I've spent a lot of my time on the biology side of things, actually it's much more important what learning science means. And my big interest has for many years been to establish learning systems that work and work at scale. And um, it has changed a little bit over time. I started with team training and human factors like 25 years ago. <laughs> and, and it's not Corona, by the way. Um, I've been in isolation for three weeks now. Um, it's um, like basically the last many years I've been focused on and, and working on how do people learn when they learn on their own? Um, and we started studying that about 20 years ago because we couldn't get far enough in the very sophisticated environments where we were, where we were practicing the very sophisticated or very high level, high order thinking skills, communication, teamwork, collaboration. Many of the things that we today refer to as 21st century skills, we were after them in medicine back in the 90s. That led to an interest in actually, could we get some of these things out of the way in a much more efficient way uh, and is there anything that like with the enormous amount of knowledge that we needed to deal with and, and try to learn, could we, could we find cheaper ways, more efficient ways 
so that we could both get some more time for the hard things, but also don't waste the hard learning environments like simulators or other very, very expensive environments. And, and, the, and the corollary in, in, um, in K-12 is the classroom training, the time you have together, either with a teacher or with your peers, that's also a very precious time. But de facto, a lot of the time you are learning on your own. And this current situation, uh, this is an accentuated thing. Like you don't have somebody to help you. And that's the thing we've been studying the last 20 years. And it's one of the most frustrating things when you get stuck. When you, when you have a learning environment where, um, where you can't get help, you really feel the pressure to perform um, and you can't get anywhere. That's the most demotivating thing we've found ever. And that's where the science part of the, not brain science, but learning science comes in. That I think that one of the obligations we have as an industry, and I have to make a big disclaimer early, I don't have a ton of things that I can just give away. Um, we, are, we do actually have a fourth grade curriculum from our research lab where we are looking at a, at a new way with a much higher granularity of formative assessment that anybody who are interested can reach out afterwards. And we, we are giving it away actually, but it's not something that is production grade that can change the uh, American education system tomorrow. Because right now it's only fourth grade. Um, we also have several other grades, but they're not complete. Um, this is like two, hour, two years too early. But, but what is important is that the science part, this ability to, to actually figure out what works and what doesn't work is an important thing we as an industry, when we are to prepare for the next one, needs to get better at. Because there is a lot of things out there that is more like learning alchemy, where like, I'm sure that there are nobody on this call who belongs in that category. But, but there are so many, so many things that are claimed to work that has not really been proven with randomized control studies or the other things that we normally in science would say, this is necessary to figure out whether it works. Long story short, about 20 years ago, we were trying to figure out what works better when you're trying to learn something on your own. Being, in other words, where you, where you don't have a teacher, you don't have your peers. And we, we started studying one-on-one -on -one learning situations as the most extreme example. Um, where, where we could see that here you have all the help you can get. You had one person with a brain who's 100% focused on you. And the thing we found was that, that there are two things that mattered. One of them was, of course, the emotional bond, that it's very hard to fall asleep or disengage if you are in a one-on-one -on -one situation. But there was a much more prevalent thing, which was there was a very, very short cycle interaction between the, the, the you know, teacher or facilitator, coach, mentor, call it what you will, and the learner. They, they were basically constantly monitoring that, that those best of the one-on-one one -on -one coaches or instructors, teachers, were, were very, very good at constantly monitoring, does what is happening right now, does that accomplish something productive? And that led to an interest in, could we actually produce learning environments with that? So it's an extreme version of formative assessment, right? You're, you're, every 30 seconds, you will see in these situations, 100 times a, uh, an hour, they, these, these top performers, in terms of getting something productive out of it, they were, they were checking that something worked, either through verbal or nonverbal. So of course, that makes it harder to do on a computer, but, but it could be something where you can measure uh, um, progress in smaller steps. And why is that so important? It's important because it's actually something you can get a computer to do. If you can de develop ways to make more precise measurement instruments that on a formative basis, like uh, an ultra formative basis, like constantly is understanding where is that learner um, and how can I then course correct based on what I measure. That led to the, the, the generation of adaptive systems that transformed higher ed, particularly in the US where um, McGraw Hill has made um, we've, I think we made 1,400 products and curricula and my watch, and I think they've made several hundred since then. So they're probably way over 2,000 and 25 million um, higher ed students in the U.S. And that's because higher ed is easier. Higher ed is very, very knowledge based, um, and it's also something where there is an extreme amount of uh, learning on your own. So the appetite was very big. About 10 years ago, we got interested in, in both younger kids and kids with uh, learning disabilities. Um, we also got interested in adults and actually could see that there, there was something to this madness around what if, what, what if you're able at scale to um, 
to build formative assessment layers that could constantly inform how you how you build what we have referred to as adaptive learning the, the last many years. But it's actually just the, the education world's version of precision medicine. Like no no person wants to go to their go to their physician and get the average prescription from the last 10 patients. That physician is trained to be very, very diligent about how do you how do you measure precisely what's going on for that individual that individual patient? Um, All right, and, let, me, let me stop you for two seconds. So talk about the yep. adaptive learning because I think that's really we're, that's what we're in right now. If you will, we might not have all the tools in front of us, but we almost have to figure out. So adaptive means and describes the process by which a student progresses, and there's a tool or content that says, oops, you're going to go back because you didn't quite get that lesson, right? It's kind of a little bit of what's at the heart of a Cree. It's in Lexpor, which we just talked about. How is that, how is that working or could that work where people right now are in this position? Yeah, so there are several adaptive tools out there um, that, that could be used straight away. The, one of the challenges is that, for instance, McGraw, I don't think you could buy them and single use of licenses. I tried when my daughter started uh, college, I tried to buy some of my old products that I didn't have access to anymore. We sold that part of the company to McGraw and, and I, had to, I ended up getting my money back because unless there was an instructor who signed her up for it, she couldn't use it. So I, I don't know whether they may have fixed it since then. Um, but I, so I think that, that right now it is a little bit of a wild west in terms of what works and what doesn't work. And I think a lot of the people on the call have great solutions that are readily usable um, as, a, as I said, I'm happy if somebody's interested in math and, and younger great math teaching, we, uh, we can open up our lab for people. Um, but, but what is important about adaptive learning is this, um, and what we've worked on the last 15 years is this uh, approach to saying, we want to very, very precisely shape the learning path to an individual learner. But there's been a lot of people promising to solve that problem the last years. And we disagree profoundly on one, on one area which is, I, I, if there is one thing I still use from brain science, it is I have way too much respect for the brain to think that we can model this from neurons and up. We can't map the brain. We don't even know how it's roughly related, how these things like roughly talk to each other in the brain, which is why we have, we've very much gone the other direction being like, let's more try to see if we can shape learning paths around what we observe with learners. So we're much more in the psychological science and the biological sciences where we are where we're trying to to make these things um, almost you build the model on the go or as you fly the plane for that individual learner and that's you, the thing that do you think that that individual learning we were just talking about because so many people again are so concerned and so stressed out how am i supposed to do this at home how is the teacher supposed to help how's a parent supposed to help they're not an educator do you think we're missing something about the way students even students from less advantage can learn based on what you know about brain like how do we how do we overcome this fear of where we are right now what what can you tell us to make us feel better about the brain so i i actually think that that the the main the main reason for the uh, lack of comfort is when people don't know how to get out of that bind they're in if they can't get help if they don't know what to do the reason why we got onto this in the first place was that when we were studying cognitive workload in operating theaters back in the 90s, one of the main culprits in terms of generating cognitive workload is if you don't know what to do. Then you get super stressed out and you begin to make mistakes. It's exactly the same when you look at a third grader who, who feels under enormous stress. Anybody ever seen a third grader who was wildly in doubt about what they were supposed to do, who were in a really good learning spot? Not really, right? So I think that a large part of this is to do what we um, in other parts of sciences are calling cognitive task analysis. Try to say, are there some things where we can actually give people the success feeling by learning it in isolation and then put it together when we meet? Um, how do we make sure that there is answers to, to your specific questions, not some general stuff, but to your specific questions? And the challenge, of course, is that it's extremely complicated to make these kinds of ultra formative assessment systems that can like with a super high granularity help inform what's going on. So we don't work directly with schools. We work with the people who develop the content 
and we we provide the science and the and the platforms that you can then develop content of this kind. So we work with I actually think a couple of the organizations that are on the call. Um, I do think there is one other thing as well, which is unconscious incompetence has been another of my very big areas of interest the last ten years, uh, actually almost twenty. Um, and this is this aspect where you don't know what you don't know. It's an aspect of metacognition where a very large part is that people meander around and think that they know a lot of a lot of stuff and they don't. And that's really, really hard to navigate, particularly when you're learning on your own, which is which this particular case right now is an extreme example of. So we don't know, right. So so and it's uncomfortable, we don't know what we don't know in a way, right? And so what does that do, for example, that sort of the whole the whole piece of the stress? Is it better to, you know, in your estimation, give someone something modest to work on and let them piece, feel successful? Is that what you're saying? Rather than feel like you have to educate them for the whole time? Um, would it be better for parents and teachers out there to look for adaptive things or adaptive tools that do the work for us? Because my impression from when you talked about it and what little I know about adaptive is that the program keeps you going. So yes, we can't necessarily be a parent and call up McGraw Hill and say, send me your tools. We can call our district, right? Or a school and say, can I have that and bring it home? A lot of people out there listening today want to know what they can do in their district or their community to get what they need to be successful. So if they know, for example, that there's something out there that they could bring home, and so as my child's doing math on you know their phone or a Chromebook or even on paper, if there's a way for them to loop back for feedback, wouldn't that be better than me standing over saying, oh, what was my long division? I can't remember that. So unfortunately, the answer is that I don't think adaptive is a, is a magic thing that works just because it's adaptive. I think uh, there are lots of different approaches that will work. So I actually think it's a much more question of looking for the science that proves and the things that work because the, the frustrating things that we find also the last few weeks when we've been looking at this, we have the last week's been looking more at adults than kids, although I will end on one happy note with a kid. But, but it is that people get really frustrated when things don't work. When I ask parents, when I ask teachers, it's when you, when you actually know that what we're doing right now does not have a high likelihood of giving us the results we want. Just because it's electronic, just because it's adaptive doesn't mean that it works. And I think that we, we as an industry have completely missed the boat in terms of providing that, um, that level or that scrutiny that you have, for instance, in medicine. We won't allow anybody to go out now with a drug that isn't approved. Like, see Fauci every day? He's saying, yes, but we're not going to make harm first, even in a situation like this. We may loosen some of the restrictions, but we want to be sure that things are safe. That's why a vaccine takes so long, because we're going to give it to healthy patients. Anyway, coming back to what then happens to, uh, to people when you give them something that works, we, we developed together with some leading experts in the world, a, a course for laboratory medicine, that we were really happy when it hit 1,000 certifications. We did it together with the, uh, the group that also publishes New England Journal of Medicine um, and a bunch of others and some of the top phys physicians in the world. This morning, we have certified 56,000 people in 17 days. That's because there are people who are looking for something where they have a high comfort that when they go back into those patients, when they take those samples, they want to know what's up and down. But I'll end on a happier note with a kid who was deeply frustrated learning from home. It's my nephew in Denmark and his uh, parents are our lawyers. And they called me and they said, you, you've developing some, been developing something in math. We are going crazy that we've become full-time teachers. Can we try some of it with them? And they, like my highlight of the month was not the 56,000 physicians and, and laboratory medicine. It was when he chose to do a geometry instead of a bedtime story the other day. Because I do actually think that even kids, and he's a second grader, we gave him fourth grade math. Um, and we, like, I even think kids can tell the difference between whether something works or whether it does. It's a great, it's a great point. Kids are, are self-motivated if we give them the tools, exactly. So a couple of quick questions for you. Do you think that using systems that use analytics and modern those analytics and have the human meet the learners where they struggle is the best way to do that until we have access to adaptive systems is one question. I think I got that right. 
So I think I think analytics can help for sure. I don't think there is a lot of the analytics that work is not magical. Like of course, if you can get a heat map out of out of which of your kids or students who are struggling, and you can focus your attention there, it's a complete no-brainer to do that. So I think that that si the simplest analytics uh, are often very very impactful, and I don't think anybody should be looking for analytics to come up with like super high predict uh, like super detailed projections about what an individual learner should do, but analytics of the kind where you're like, oh, I, I can see somebody here who's, who's really struggling getting the work done or putting the hours in or like give them that, that call and find out and use that human interaction to say, what's going on? Maybe they actually had both of their parents just admitted to hospital and you can do something. Not about the admission, but about the kid's motivation. And this is a uh, question uh, that was posed earlier for someone else, but I think you can uh, maybe address it. Are there examples of feedback loops that you found to be effective in that work? I mean, if analytics give you then feedback, then you go to something else. I mean, how, how can a, again, a parent or a teacher or, or, a, or an edu a leader out there right now help us, our kids learn? And I'd ask so, also, are they gonna lose so much time not being in a classroom that we're gonna be starting everybody over? Like, give me your thoughts on that too. I think, I think the best tools out there might actually be an advantage compared to, to some of what's going on because there is some time lost. So the best tools apply to students who are not in the best schools. I think that might beat it. I don't think the best tools will beat the best schools. The, like there is nothing that beats great teachers in classrooms with with very few students around them but i think that that there are a couple of patterns that we found in research that i really would be looking for the number one is that the best way to demotivate a, a top performing learner is to force them to sit through instruction not not necessarily assessments but instruction that that they profoundly think is irrelevant the second best way to um, to demotivate a learner is to uh, test somebody in something where they don't feel like they've had a fair chance to learn it. And e-learning systems have a very, very uh, prevalent um, occurrence of this, right? It happens all the time that, that, we, that we have these two cardinal sins exhibited. But what is interesting is you can actually do one thing. You, it's totally fine to ask um, people who are, who are really good uh, to show to show you that you're good, which allows you to do formative assessment much more aggressively than we've ever thought. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, we're discuss what's the difference between formative assessment and summative assessment? What do people need to know about formative assessment? In other words, right now, I'm at home. Let's say I had smaller children. I don't anymore. What's formative? So formative assessment is what you use to guide instruction, guide what is going on with the kid. You do it on an ongoing basis. You do not do it to measure how good the kid is as a person or at the end of the term to get guide which college they're going into. You're purely doing it on the way to guide what, you, what you're going to do. Summative, in, in, uh, summative assessment is to that we get a ranking of kids at the end of uh, school year so that we can say that Peter is better than Anna and um, in my opinion, should go away as fast as possible. And parents naturally do, and caregivers naturally do formative assessment, right? Johnny, yes. did you clean your room, right? Show me you cleaned your room. Did you just get that? Oh yes, you know, what is that bird out there? That's a lark. Well, what does a lark do? A well, lark usually comes in the spring. And then you talk at the end of the week, did the, you know, when does the lark usually come? Oh, it comes in the spring, right? We do things like that. Did I eat, you know, what are we eating for dinner? Is there food for dinner, right? Oh, once you get the food, how do we get our food? I mean, everything that you could imagine if you're providing the right feedback is kind of formative, right? Yes, but I would, I would probably condense it a little bit further. Formative assessment is a, is a very, very, it can be used as a very targeted tool. So I, I would think that it's, it's much more like when the kid is doing math and you're trying to find out how are you doing with this? Can you explain me the thinking behind that? Um, can you try to solve these three, three uh, problems? And then based on what the result of that is, you decide how do we spend the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Of course, formative assessment in, in, in normal school systems is that you give a test and then you, then you decide, do they get the advanced course or do they get the normal course? 
Um, that can also be a way to use formative assessment. Uh, and it can also, and it often, unfortunately, formative assessment is also used as a fear generating thing, or some would say a motivation generator, where you would have uh, kids who are, who are saying, I want to perform well at midterms because I don't want to get a bad grade. But a formative assessment performed well is something where it's non-punitive completely. And what is interesting is we published a, an article together with uh, the NEGM group in New England Journal of Medicine that showed that if you do formative assessment at this level of granularity, you don't need summative assessment at the end, um, which is why some of the first boards uh, in medicine are removing the board exams, the renewal yeah, board exams. Really, really phenomenal. Ulrich, thank you so much for being with us today. We will make sure everybody has your contact info and, um, and knows how to get in touch. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And thanks all for hanging in there. Thank you. We are so happy to bring in our next um, and final group of people um, to talk about kind of you know where the workforce belongs in all of this. And, and frankly, a lot of workers are not only confined to their own um, you know, areas, uh, but they're losing, they're losing ground. And so um, we have three fantastic people with us. We have um, Lucilla Crosta, who's actually coming to us from Italy, uh, who Hi. is the head and creator of iJuly. Ciao. Hi. Uh, Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, we also have uh, my friend Ash from StarDed, who's going to say his last name, because even to this day, after knowing him for as long as I have, I'm a really bad student, and I have not yet done that well. Um, and Sam Kayochi from um, Huddle One. And these are three fabulous innovators, entrepreneurs, technologists who are not only helping to connect learning um, to other learners and very interested in this entire space, but play a little bit more on the side of um, adult and career, which is critical, I know, for an awful lot of people out there. So um, Lucila, welcome, Ash and Sam, uh, great to have you. I kind of just want to jump in and maybe um, ask Lucila to start by talking a little bit about, you know, sort of how, like how you see what you do working in today's environment. Um, and, uh, you know, you guys were on, on the, we really, our hearts go out to you with Italy being, you know, so much touched by this across the country and we're, and we're learning and we're rooting for you. So um, let me know what you think about kind of where you think this all connects now for us. Yes, thanks very much Jeannie, or also for not only for your invitation, but also for your words. Uh, I feel really privileged to be here today and to have the chance uh, to uh, share with you not only what I do, but also I can see to share a common issue so issues that are common all over the world. I've been listening to, with, with lots of interest, all your stories, all, your, all what you are doing in schools, in higher education, and I feel that the story is really the same here. So uh, we are all uh, struggling, we are all trying to rush to move our students in K-12 or in higher education into the online environment. We are all a bit unprepared and we try to, to find solutions to help the teachers to learn how to use this technology to help our students. So I can see that everything is more or less the same. Um, um, today I am here with you uh, talking more about the workforce. Uh, what, what we do here uh, in Italy is uh, to work with technology and uh, used for helping adults for learning online and for developing specifically the so-called soft skills. So, uh, we, we, we work and we, we uh, are focused very much on these soft skills. So let's say we, when, we, when I talk about soft skills, I refer to um, how, uh, for example, we are able to work together, how we are able to solve a problem, to think, uh, for example, critically or to communicate in an effective way with each other. 
and uh, these all these things uh, are actually getting more and more important uh, um, not only because uh, usually these are key skills uh, uh, that employer would like to find in the in the people they hire but also nowadays in the situation that we are currently living in are getting even more and more important if we think that uh, for example our students are have been put uh, uh, you know uh, to learn and study online uh, our workers work from home now so uh, uh, how for example uh, they are they able now to work in in a new environment where they have to respect deadlines where they have uh, to be uh, to become more autonomous uh, workers and learner how they can be able to achieve tasks uh, sometimes in isolation rather than in their work environment in their in their traditional work environment so we actually think that these skills are becoming even more important than before because of, of what is happening around us and um, and, and also because uh, if we think that the machine and, and technology is running so quickly and perhaps in the future we'll be able to, let's say, uh, perform uh, some technical tasks much better than humans, we, we think that uh, uh, it's very difficult uh, uh, to think that the machine will be able to perform these soft skills much better than human in the, in the near future. So that's, that's actually uh, what, what we do. So we, we focus very much our work on the development of technology that can help uh, uh, not only workers, but also higher education, higher education students to develop these soft skills in preparation of the uh, workplace, of, the, of their future job environment. Um, yeah. Um, I, yeah. Drop real quick. I imagine that one of the other challenges that I'd love you and then Sam and Ash to address too is, you know, the, the enormous number of, again, people who are now not working, people whose higher ed or, you know, sort yeah. of career trajectory has been stopped. So while we're talking about helping our younger students, right, learn and how do we help people in the K-12 and even a little bit in the higher ed spectrum, there are people out there who I would think we want to be helping now to develop the skills so that when our world comes back, and it will come back. Um, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> they're in a position to move into something. What can they be doing on their own and at home while they're confined to develop themselves? Yeah, uh, what we can offer uh, at the moment uh, uh, is, for example, uh, the access to our, uh, we call a July Intelligent Library, which is basically a library where uh, whoever accesses it can find uh, hundreds of resources, uh, of uh, high quality selected resources for developing seven or more soft skills. So people uh, can create an an, um, an account for free during the spring for us as well so we offer this access to uh, everyone who would like to use our material for learning um, for you know developing these skills and uh, uh, they can actually be recommended by our artificial intelligence engine uh, learning material according with their level so there might be some uh, someone who access the library who are who is at, at a basic level basic level in leadership for example somebody else who access the library who is an expert instead in critical thinking and according with the level they have uh, the library recommend them targeted material for improving the skill and for getting to the next level Great. so that's really helpful and yeah that's that we'll make sure they have access to that. Let me bring in Sam now also to talk a little bit about that and we'll kind of be having this conversation we'll continue Lucila. Sam, so you are looking at also kind of how to monitor and sort of enhance and upskill workers while you are. Talk a little bit about what Huddle One does and how it kind of be in that same field Lucila was just talking about. Sure, sure. So, you know, uh, we're working pretty on uh, pretty aggressively right now. Uh, 
as a business, our focus is making workforce training uh, more accessible, more interactive, more engaging. We do that through mobile games. Uh, you know, I, I kind of say that my life over the last three weeks have been comprised of sort of two types of phone calls right now with founders and CEOs and executives that use our platform. Uh, one is, you know, we have, there's a lot of executives out there who are uh, sort of leaning in to what's happening. They're uh, finding ways to move forward even despite the difficult decisions they have to make. Uh, we do a lot of work with restaurants and hospitality brands. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's ugly, it's tough, and they're making tough decisions. Um, and unfortunately, there's also a lot of businesses who are doing the opposite and are sort of leaning back and, you know, uh, I don't think doing everything that they can be doing for their people right now, because to second your point, this, the curve will flatten people will come back to work. And, you know, we try to emphasize to, to, to executives that uh, when they show back up, uh, they're going to remember how you treated them right now. And, you know, now's the time to lead and it's tough. There's no doubt about it. Uh, so uh, I think the unfortunate thing, and there've been a lot of really great conversation over the last two hours, I think, you know, accessibility has been a major problem in workforce training. Uh, the frontline worker gets access to a fraction of what the C-level worker gets access to. Uh, we've uh, been advocating for two years on how we need to make workforce training not just more accessible, i.e. meet them where they are on mobile, but also access more skill development across job functions. Because today I might be a security guard, but tomorrow I might, I might be a bartender. And then the next day I might be in charge of catering. Uh, you know, I think there are companies that are really struggling with, you know, the decision that they've made to only allow workforce training in the back room on a tablet or a learning platform that is not accessible, you know, outside of an IP address. Uh, so I think that businesses that are going to succeed coming out of this are the ones that will, were already set up well, and the ones that respond right now. Um, la last thing I'll say we talk a lot about skill training and I love what Lucila said about, uh, you know, the so, soft, uh, there's a lot of great content we need to be focusing on, but I also think now is a time to focus on culture. And we're seeing a lot of brands we work with use our platform to do something so simple, like keep their people together. Uh, you know, we use mobile games, some of the most popular games on our platform. And we've seen a, a 7x surge in the last uh, uh, two weeks have been games like on their staff, games on their culture, games on their mission. These, uh, it's not training, but it's, it's interesting. And I think there needs to be a balance of, of that, you know, that type of material in addition to um, you know, job readiness and, and some of the other topics that are important as well. And before I bring in Ash, let me just ask you a question. Um, uh, so you and Lucila are, again, you're looking at workforce, you're looking at soft skills that students need to be prepared, a little bit of different things from the same genre. Um, what does this say to parents? Like, what do we say to parents of younger people? What can the high school age kids be doing, right? What can middle school kids be doing right now to be thinking strategically about how they engage while they've got some time on their hands in a world that's going to be very different when they when we all come out of this. Sure, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, we work with a program here in Newark, New Jersey called uh, the All Star Project. It's an after school development program for youth age, you know, 15 to 17. And they're struggling right now because uh, businesses are not going to be taking on their summer internships for these uh, for these students. And, uh, you know, I had a comment, I had a call yesterday with a few of their, um, you know, instructors. And I said, right now, we need to be leaning into the type of training around how, you know, future of work was coming. It's just been accelerated. And my short comment would be, I think this levels the playing field for younger workers. Uh, you know, there's a lot of workers out there and businesses that have no idea how to operate remote. And they're trying to figure it out. And their workers are trying to figure it out. And I said to, you know, I said to one of the directors, you're 15, 16, and 17 year old that have to argue about not having experience. Well, the experience line just flattened. And I think there's major opportunity for young people 
to jump ahead uh, right now while, you know, everybody's trying to figure out how to operate remote uh, in this moment. So a major opportunity. Great point. Michela, what do you think of that? Yeah, uh, well, actually, uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, that uh, uh, what, we are, what we are experiencing now, uh, it's, not, it's not one of our best moments, but as I said, it might be taken like a good opportunity in some ways. So also for K-12, for, um, but also for uh, higher education students, uh, not only learning how to use the, the technology, but going back again to soft skill, uh, uh, learn how to critically using the technology. So uh, how, um, for example, uh, some technology can be good, some technology can be, uh, for example, not so good if used in some other ways. So uh, in some ways, uh, you can also develop soft skills among K-12 students when uh, they are actually using the digital technology. So it's, 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 some kind, it's some kind of an opportunity in some ways. We also have a, a special space into our library the, uh, devoted to, to the use of digital technologies that uh, help people not only understand how the technology works, how some technology works, but how this technology can be used nowadays, for example, in, for communication purpose. So for example, how to use uh, in a more uh, educational way, social network, or how to use uh, you know, in a more effective way, some other tool out there that our youngster use without any, for example, uh, advice or uh, that just use among themselves. So this is, a, of course, a difficult situation, but if we take this as a good opportunity, uh, we, we, we will be probably be able to take something very good out of it. Something can come out of it. Ash Calaracci, join us. Ash uh, leads uh, a phenomenal organization called StartEd, which is an accelerator and an incubator to help grow uh, new ed tech ideas. And um, so you come to this with a very broad perspective. Also the head of um, New York Ed Tech Week with Jonathan Harbour, which is scheduled in early June for now in New York. Um, Ash, you've not only heard this piece and, and dabble in the technology and the innovation. excuse me, dabble in the, the issues around Korean workforce, but K-12 as well. Tell us what you're seeing as the promise and potential of technology where we are, and, uh, and please feel free to sort of share some thoughts also on what you just heard. Sure, absolutely. And uh, Ginny, good to be here, and uh, pleased to see everybody and some familiar faces. Um, uh, again, this is Ash Kaluarachi. Uh, Kalua, I like the liqueur, if anybody asks. And uh, I'm calling in from uh, New York, uh, currently one of the most dangerous places to speak from. Um, the, uh, the point I want to make is that uh, this, this pandemic has really impacted the way we work and learn uh, rather asymmetrically. And, and I'm, I'm seeing that from what I hear um, across the board from education founders and investors who, are, who tend to be the, the folks I'm spending most of my time with um, at this point. Um, and the, the symmetry seems to be more from the perspective of uh, some companies um, uh, seeing in increased demand for their solutions, uh, spikes that are in the, the five to 10 X range of the usage of the solutions, like uh, what Sam just mentioned, he was experiencing around those soft skill uh, solutions. Um, and some companies are, are wondering what to do. Um, and uh, they don't know how to manage the next few months. I wanna put that, that, that perspective in, in a, a frame in that uh, the people who seem to uh, have, have the benefit of, of of users and customers coming to them uh, are equally, um, I'd say, clueless about why that's happening. Uh, and the folks that also are, are, not, are not understanding how to deal with the current situation are also clueless. And, I, and the way to bridge that gap is really for uh, the parents and educators of this world to, to, to connect uh, with innovators and help understand how our world has changed. Right. So 
Um, now, as of the last four weeks, how we learn, work and learn has changed significantly. And it's almost like hitting a reset button uh, on, on the last 10, 20 years in terms of how solutions were created. Solutions were unfortunately created without parents, teachers, and students in that, in that conversation, the majority of cases. And, and this is another chance we're getting uh, uh, for, for the, those voices of the most vulnerable people and the people that are affected by this, solution, this situation to be heard. Now, um, the convenient part, and, and, and I also want to add some kind of uh, uh, actionable suggestions around how parents and educators can help their students find jobs in this time and how um, they can leverage the tech community to actually make supplementary income and, and find jobs to do so. Um, uh, but the, it all starts with, you know, joining uh, websites like usertesting.com and getting paid to have your voices heard. Uh, how you learn and work has changed. And there are venues online, there are tech organizations online that will take your voice and turn those in, into solutions if they're doing their job well. Uh, but there are resources to enable that conversation. Uh, Started is, an, is another one um, that you can uh, take part in to, to be a voice. Uh, and connect with uh, the innovators who are creating solutions. And in fact, uh, don't rule out the fact that uh, if you see a unique way of, of solving what is what is happening right now, uh, you're, you could be innovated too. Uh, it, it's very easy these days in 2020, as Mike uh, has, has put many times, to, to create an organization, um, substantially less cost and substantial effort. So don't rule out the fact that while you are experiencing uh, this happen to you, you could actually be in control of your own destiny and change how we learn and work at this time. Ash, let me, let me stay on that for a couple more minutes. I love the idea of like, we can use this opportunity to actually be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. right? so, so there's not only things like getting, you know, getting paid because you've tested something, but um, working in remote ways, you've also talked a little bit about, and I know we've had, we have examples of that, virtual internships and virtual jobs out there. So, so two questions, how do people find those things? And then also, um, how do people volunteer to help students? Are there companies and organizations, do you have that, Sam? Do you have a Lucille? Ash, who do you know? where people who do have some time, maybe their kids are grown, maybe they're not in the home anymore, can do something, whether paid or not, to help us get through this with an education lens. I can dive in there with a quick suggestion. Um, uh, so uh, the, the advent of the micro internship, uh, which was the digit digitally enabled maybe uh, a couple of years ago, through organizations like uh, Parker Dewey, for example, um, uh, are, are probably one type of solution that parents can point their kids to and maybe even be involved themselves. But the micro internship is essentially uh, taking the internship and breaking that into bite-sized chunks and enabling that online. And by the way, getting paid for it, right? There are, there are tons of organizations like Parker Dewey, like Paragon One is another great one, uh, that have these online internship experiences that allow a student or a parent to sign up and then work with the company uh, for a finite duration and actually be paid. Uh, uh, and then most importantly, be hired by those organizations uh, once those internships are over. All of it online, right? Um, I'll, I'll also mention that uh, uh, solutions that are around the e-portfolio in what typically, typically were used for students to, to essentially create a portfolio for applications to, to, uh, to college, now are being repurposed to create applications for work, right? So, so, so leveraging sites like uh, trovid.com, for example, are, are great solutions um, for making sure that your experience is captured and digitally um, uh, in case to make sure that you can put that in front of employers uh, when the time comes. Uh, currently, uh, we, we've unfortunately had the most unprecedented number of unemployment uh, claims in history. So if you've been watching the news, 6.6 uh, .6 million uh, unemployment claims uh, in a week. Uh, the last, uh, the, the highest uh, previously ever experienced was uh, uh, 10 times less than that. Uh, so what we're experiencing is that a lot of people are going to be needing these types of micro internships and solutions to get back on track with the jobs that are required 
um, and it's a good place to start as because as Sam mentioned, that, uh, that experience curve has currently flattened. And it seems to me that um, while this may feel to some people who are struggling with students in their homes, a little like maybe not as related it is because if we don't figure out how we are going to upskill reskill and continue to advance um, workers or people going into work um, let alone the students who may not be able to go back to college um, who had their who had their higher ed halted how do we begin to deal with that? I'd love to just throw it up to all, all of you. How do we begin to deal with that more sort of globally? Are there policy issues? Are there issues relating to, is it just a matter of kind of jumping into um, conversations like this? I mean, there's got, there's no one, of course, the you know, labor department is part of the big, you know, three trillion or whatever it is, two trillion dollar bill that's coming down the pipe. But is there more that should and could be done? Well, uh, uh, if I can just uh, s s put a comment there, uh, uh, um, he, what is happening here in Italy, for example, is that uh, the, the, the government and companies also are making and paying more and more, more and more attention than before to this uh, smart work approach. So to the fact that people can uh, work from home uh, and that they don't need to go to work uh, uh, every day in the same space uh, altogether. So uh, I, I know that things have been uh, changed rapidly and they may go back uh, to normality perhaps in some ways from in some months but in my view things will never be as before so when you try something new like home uh, like smart working like uh, this new approach to to work and also to teach uh, you, you 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 start to understand that there is something good in that and that there is something you may want to use also after after the crisis that that can get uh, uh, things a little bit better in some ways for some cases. So what I can see here, for example, the Italian, the Lombardy region has uh, issued uh, uh, here uh, a survey asking how, um, how we are experiencing smart working, how we are dealing with that, what do we think about that, and if this, this could be a good solution for the future. So uh, workers who are, who have lost their job or who uh, you know just don't have a job may may find this uh, as a new opportunity in the future, together with the, the opportunity of uh, uh, accessing education. There is a wide variety, um, not only for, about what we offer, but there are you know training and resources can be easily accessed online from home, uh, from the internet. So I see this as a possibility in which a government, especially here in some ways, uh, perhaps are thinking about. So this is more or less uh, what I'm seeing. It's very good. And I also want to um, just mention too that, uh, you know, we had intended and part, you're, Lucille, you're part of this, uh, to have and still are planning um, a major ed tech US Italia at Innovation Festival um, now scheduled for the end of September. And one of the thing, one of the people who's part of that who was supposed to be joining us today, but he actually has to walk his wife who's a nurse to the hospital at night. Um, and it's not a pleasant walk apparently. But as Michael McDonald, and he does a lot with AR and VR in getting people to learn. And I'm re reason I'm bringing that up is because there's not only a very, very substantial ed tech world there in Italia, in Italy, um, that you all are, can use to also grapple with some of these issues. But the connection I think about learning from K through career, for us to be able to see the experiences, when I think about all the museums who put lessons virtually online, when I think about the ability to have a conversation like this globally, you know, start at is global, Lucilla, you're working globally. Um, we're all going through this across the world. And imagine if tools and services were helping not just our students, but our workers, our educators, our parents to connect across this transom, as we say. 
Um, Ash, have you seen any hope for that? And talk a little bit about maybe what, what you see coming down the pike and, and Sam, you as well in that, in that regard. I mean, we could be using this time ho at home to be entering new territories, right? Uh, uh, certainly, and, and, and I'll go back to um, uh, one of my initial comments around um, uh, understanding how the world's changed. Um, so uh, if we spend our time currently understanding the, the needs of the people that we serve, this is actually a great time to, to check in and, and be human and be empathetic about what those, what those changes are. And I think that um, whoever it is that we spend our, our time with on, on a daily basis, whether they be um, you know, students, parents, educators, investors, entrepreneurs, all the stakeholders in this, in this ecosystem, um, I think it's, it's equally important to understand how the dynamics between uh, those groups might potentially change as well. Um, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that, uh, and, and maybe I'll ask Sam and Lucia to, to go as well. Yeah, and Sam, I was going to say, talk a little bit about that, and I also want you to address like specifics about how we can be, you know, again, those of us who kind of are typically work remotely or have experience working remotely because we have people in lots of places, this isn't the same. So how do we, how do we transition into that? How do we make sort of our, 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 our mindset more global as a result of all this? Sure, and, and, and you know, one point, uh, you know, you talked a few minutes ago about government's role in, in sort of this transition. You know, I think for a long time, uh, certain labor rules that had the, that were very well intended uh, restricted folks from access to job skills when they need it most. And I think we're seeing that today. Uh, you know, I, I've talked to a few, a few municipalities in the last uh, few days who uh, job readiness programs are just have stopped uh, because job ready, a lot of the uh, cities have job readiness programs that are highly reliant on live instruction. And the folks who would typically access that live instruction don't have access to a laptop or a desktop from home. And I think that there's just so much that's occurred. One of the things we have to learn as we come out of this is that uh, I think we're entering, you know, the, we're not entering a world. A lot of the folks on this call understand this from, you know, the way we use technology. We need to make sure that access also includes um, allowing somebody, if they raise their hand and say they want to get better at something, to be able to do that, whether they're on the clock or off the clock. And, you know, we fought for the last few years with companies who, I always joke, we're as a mobile workforce tool, and Ash knows this, I've had, we've had to build more features to stop participation because HR teams have said, we love it, but is there any way we can turn it off when they're not here? And, you know, they're the ones we're talking to right now that are saying, hey, we want to turn that on. <laughs> so, you know, we have to learn from that. I think, you know, globally, you know, to your point, uh, we, we have to, um, there, there's, there's just so much opportunity to connect people today uh, across, across borders with job skills. And, and, and it, it has to start with uh, everybody on a call like this, like thinking about ways to, um, we're moving into a world where potentially we're gonna see 30 plus percent unemployment here in the US. Uh, there's more people that aren't responding to an HR person anymore than ever before. Uh, and there's a massive opportunity to work bottom up in our workforce to create the next, uh, the ne the next what what the requirements are for the job of tomorrow. And I just think that that's that's where we should be thinking from a technology perspective. The workers have control right now, and it's our opportunity to enable and empower them. And it's interesting because you know prior to this pandemic, um, so sad, uh, we had seven million jobs in the U.S. we couldn't fill. I know I was talking to Lucila about issues in, in Italy about getting people to take particular jobs that were available and not having enough people to do certain things. Uh, Texas Central Railroad need to hire 10,000 people to build a high-speed rail. And now those 7 million jobs are what? Zero? Negative? 
seven million? You know, what what's that what's that look like? Does that mean everyone's gonna need not just to reskill, but um, what does it mean? Is it reskill? Is it new skill? Is it is it just a new world that they're gonna have to adapt to? And I, I would probably say it's all of the above. We have to we have to invest in technologies that move as fast as work moves. And I think that's the problem with, there's an infrastructure problem with a lot of business models. Um, again, just a, an observation, we've had at least 30 to 40% of our direct points of contact, which is generally the learning and development or HR job function in companies, be furloughed. So, you know, our customer's care team doesn't know who to talk to in some companies. Uh, but we still see participation happening and users using, and we're keeping platforms live to try to help people and worrying about everything else and billing later. But, you know, this top-down model of only a few folks inside of the enterprise that can choose what content people have access to, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's time has come. It's been long overdue. And I think this is an opportunity for us to learn from learn and move forward. So Sam, can people connect with you through Huddle One and uh, your website? What's the best way if they want to engage with uh, Huddle One? And then I kind of want to ask a final question of everybody. What's your advice for parents and teachers going through this from sort of the K through higher ed perspective? What would you have them be doing? How would you suggest that they that they deal with, educate or not, their kids. You know what I mean? Is remote learning something they should be doing? And um, how can we best help them do that? Yeah. It's like you asked, you asked that question and my, my, my daughter started, started crying. I don't know if she heard it. Uh, <laughs> sorry to cut you off. I, I was just going to say, we'll, we'll post something in the Q&A for how to connect with us. Uh, uh, with, with our platform, we're doing a lot with, you know, we've sort of opened it up like everybody else on this call has been doing great work right now to do that. Um, so we'll make that available. Uh, I'll perhaps comment there, Ginny, as well. Um, rather than going to uh, kind of overall summary, since it is a complex question, I'll point to a resource. Um, uh, the, the tech community came together and, and created some resources, both for teachers and parents, uh, separately at uh, schoolclosures.org. Um, and it's a great set of tools uh, that harken back to what I mentioned around uh, fi um, finding supplementary income, finding new jobs, how do you deal with creating a schedule for your kids uh, at home, and then some free tools attached to each of those strategies. So schoolclosures.org is, is a great one to, to start with. That's great. Lucila, last word, and then we're going to bring our friend Michael Mo back in. Yes, uh, uh, my last uh, thought, uh, uh, I, I, for teachers and, and for, for parents who are at home with the kids, uh, teaching them uh, and perhaps helping them moving uh, in the future to higher education is, uh, you have a great opportunity now to spend lots of time with them. Uh, you teach them to how to be as a person, uh, not just to learn uh, some content and that's it, because uh, there is a big difference, uh, you know, uh, about what we learn and how you teach them, how you pass your value to them now in this, 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 this difficult moment. Try to build a good relationship with them, because uh, if if you, if you, if, if your kids say would be adults who will be able to well relate with each other and with future, uh, and the future with other people, they will have the right skills, uh, the skills that uh, 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 um, uh, um, entrepreneurs are looking for uh, in people, not just. Um, uh, skills like being able to perform a task, but uh, being able to be to uh, to build a relationship with other people as a person. So this is a really great opportunity for you as a parent to uh, to spend time with them and to give the, them this life lesson. I love that. It's about resilience. It's about difficulty. It's about the cha overcoming challenges. Yes. And it's about yes. trying to get to know uh, everyone again. And we've been so go, go, go. This does give us that yes. opportunity to learn in new and different ways as well. Thanks, Ginny, for translating this to me in a good, in, in a good oh. American. <laughs> well, to an Italian to end us in a great, in, in a great way. 
Um, thank you to um, this great panel. Michael Moe, you've been listening. Um, did we, do you think we um, hit the points? And what else do people out there need to know? Um, and where do we go from here? Well, first of all, I think just having the opportunity to have this uh, robust discussion is incredibly helpful. And, uh, and thank you for again, hosting it. I would say something that struck me just listening, you know, the title of this webinar is flattening the curve. And I think one of the key takeaways is, yes, we have to flatten the curve for this disease and how we are able to go forward. But we're, the, the world is being flattened in a positive way in terms of the, the access to resources and information and ideas and ways to accelerate learning accelerate techniques and tools to be um you know to, to to be successful to go into this brave new world this new frontier i mean you know we're in this in the big community and that's that's exciting flattening organizations so it's not this top down totem pole you know and you know one or two people cut wreck everything it's flattening and ideas come from a lot of different places opportunities to accelerate are important and i guess the last thing i would say is the fact that, I mean, change was here before this all happened. I think in some number of people said this either directly or implied it, which is this change has just been compressed or accelerated. And so whether that's the acceleration to digital learning, whether that's the acceleration of the new, you know, jobs and the new economy, I mean, this is all taking place just a lot faster than, and it was happening fast before, well, it's just been accelerated when it's, it's here today. So I like to say in, the, in this innovation economy that we're in, change is the constant. I think seeing change happen faster and faster. You know, New McDonald has a startup and it's about EIEIO. It's entrepreneurship, innovation, education, impact and opportunity. That's where the world's going. I think this conversation hopefully is the, is, is the first of an ongoing dialogue. I think this kind of episodic getting together and sharing gets replaced from this kind of stream, if you will, of connectivity, community, and collaboration. So again, I think this was a, a tremendous, um, tremendous uh, opportunity today, and I look forward to continue the conversation in the future, but I thought it was terrific. So that's, that's, that's sort of my um, you know, quick commentary. I really appreciate that, Michael. And Michael Masanti, I'm gonna let you end it for us, but I'll just say that in addition to what you just shared with us, um, you you know, the, the, what I'm taking away also is this notion of flattening and community requires information. And you often talk about how we need to remove the friction. And that took me a long time to understand what that means, but essentially there's so much information out there. There's infobesity, you like to say. Yeah. And to overcome, like, where do I go for this information? Well, I'm sitting here thinking because we put up this great page, um, countering COVID on our website, because we're tracking stuff, because we're tweeting it, that millions of people are seeing it. And they're not, because it's, there's so much. And to be able to find it is difficult. And what I'm taking away from the folks who are here today, who are participating, asking is we have to do more to push that information out now that the world is flat again, if you will, it should be easier and it's more in demand. And so thoughts that you have about how we can do that together, we should um, definitely explore in the future. Yeah, well, I think it just, the, the world's awash in information. Uh, what, what we need is insight. And I think insight is derived by helping filter out a lot of this information into specific thoughts and action and wisdom. And I think we have an opportunity to do that. And again, and, and again today I think is, is, is progress forward. Listen, I wanna thank everyone, first of all, on our panel, Michael, thank you to all of our panels, to all of our speakers. Um, you guys were incredible. I hope uh, we're getting some great comments. I hope we've been able to at least provide some basic solutions, some basic resources to you. We, we know that um, there's a lot of information out there. We're gonna do our best to get you answers. Um, and uh, just, a, just a brief message out there to everybody on the front lines, healthcare workers, doctors, everybody who's doing those really tough jobs right now, we are with you. Uh, let's try to stay positive, even in the midst of all of this. 
um, and let's ensure that all of our kids, everyone who wants access to something that's going to move them to the next level education-wise, um, um, experience-wise, job-wise, if we all hang together, if we all do it together, uh, it will happen. And, um, and listen, thank you for joining us today. We will, uh, this has been taped and recorded. Uh, we will make it available on the website, on CER's website, edreform.org. You will get it there. And we will continue to push out every idea and resource that we can to all of you. Good luck to all of you. Keep safe, keep healthy, and keep fighting.